Let's jump right into it. The bearded man that any of you uh, can see watching the, uh, the video portion of this. His name is Dave Damashek. All around, uh, I don't know, broadcaster, writer, blogger, um, sarcastic Twitterer. Uh, and I think number one on his list is Pittsburgh native that he still holds uh, strong ties to. Lives in L.A. now, but sticks with those Pittsburgh tough guys and shows a lot of grit and toughness all the time. But let's welcome more to Dave Demischek to the show. Hawk, what's the poop, fella? How are you? I'm great, man. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I remember when I first started this thing, I started talking about it. I was like, I got to get you on. And now I finally did. The thing is, you... Um, you host your own deal, you know, the, the, the Dave Damashek football program that you have. You run that, what, a couple times a week? Yeah, do it a couple times a week. And, of course, I'm pleased to be speaking. I feel, in a way, I take no credit for you launching this, but in a way, I feel like you, you know, you sharpened your teeth a little bit or whatever the cliche is, when, because in 2013, you won the award. For the Shecky Award, we do them at the end of the year every year. You won the Shecky Award for our favorite football playing guest. You know, high honor because of how entertaining you were. Believe me, I'm. I'm. Uh, it was an honor for me to get that. And this year, I, I missed out on it. I know I was. I was a little MIA coming on the show. I wasn't able to come on as much as I wanted. So that's going to be my excuse for not winning it this year. Um, hopefully, this coming year, I can. I can get on there on a more regular basis and really let the. Yeah. Let your fan base hear me and, and really try to go back and forth with you, especially since I'll be in Cincinnati. I'm so close to your, your guys in, in Pittsburgh now. I'm sure we'll have plenty of things to talk about. Yeah, well, this will go right there. <laughs> there it is. I see it. You got the Bengals about, helmet right about, over his shoulder. Hawk, how can we maintain any sort of uh, kinch, any sort of friendship when you do this? You could have gone, all right, so the Packers said goodbye. It's been a fun time. You could have gone to 30 different teams. Why would you go to inside the Steelers division? Just don't go Ravens Brown for this team with this ridiculous helmet. The helmet's amazing. First off, my two kids are so <laughs> pumped about that. I was really worried about them uh, transitioning out of Green Bay, and it'll be a little little bit of a change for them once they realize we're not going back there, which they kind of they get it already, or at least my daughter does, who's four. But when I showed them the Bengals helmets, they – were juiced. They were sold. And my daughter told me last night when I put her to bed, she wanted to make sure I was going on Amazon and ordering her a Bengals hat because she wants to wear one to school, I guess. So I got that ordered. It's coming. I'm sorry for going against your guys in Pittsburgh, but, you know, that's just how it works out. You know, Cincinnati was my uh, – they're my team growing up. I love love watching those guys. And the thing about it is we have all kind of things that really pull at our friendship, if you think about it. The uh, the one Super Bowl I was I was a part of and able to win, we beat your Pittsburgh Steelers. So if that doesn't, I didn't if, care for that. We did. We, we didn't really have. Uh, we didn't really. I know didn't each know other. you then. Yeah. So I'm sure you hated me from afar. I I was always a big fan of yours from afar. So <laughs> I feel like I took the high road there. But we we made it through that, and we've talked about that game a bunch. And and uh, I see. I think we we can get through this. It'll be good. All right, we'll make it through. But I want you to concede. No jive, Hawk. That's an ugly helmet. You can't. All right, fine for little kids, but you're a grown man. You can't. I like it. It cool. looks good. I'm telling you, it's so. I, obviously, I'm very used to. I've played nine years in Green Bay, so that's all I know when it comes to uniforms. And I know you're a whole. You have like a. You write stuff. You write like the blogs yeah. or about uniform reports and like the greatest matchups of different uniforms against each other. So yeah. I guess you're the go-to guy when it comes to it. But I don't know. I think it's. I, I like it, man. I like the. Uh, I don't know. It's just different. It looks good. It's what I grew up with. What do you mean? How can I not like it? All right, fine. I'm thrilled for you on a – because you know, Hawk, I, I like the human element of these things, of uh, these pro football decisions. And for you, how cool that you get to go back to your home state. First of all, muzzle tub on your Buckeyes winning the national title. That must have been fun for you to watch. But to now get to go back where you played your college ball or at least close to it and your whole family can come and, uh, you know, Winnebago to the games and everything. How cool is that going to be? That's right. They're all going to saddle up in the old Winnebago. Um, probably like 30 people in one 1975 Winnebago. Hope it makes it down to Cincinnati and come watch the <laughs> game. So, yeah, it's, it worked out great for me, man. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to, to getting there and loved, loved all my time in Green Bay and will love that place forever. But... I told you before we hit record here. If I couldn't play in, uh, if 
I couldn't play in Green Bay, Cincinnati was was my spot. I was I was hoping to find a way to get to, and I did. So I thank them for that. And the, the fans here and the support we've had in Ohio already are awesome. And well, we, like I I told you before we started recording too, I've been to Cincinnati, and I think it's a fine place. It's the poor man's <laughs> Pittsburgh. <laughs> Whereas you have just one river running through yours and some hills, we have three in Pittsburgh. Yeah, you do. And I, you know? I've, uh, I don't think I ever was inside three rivers. I, uh, I riverfront. The thing is, what was what were all the yeah, stadiums? Like, They're all the same thing, though. Yep. It there was, was like riverfront. There was the vet in Philadelphia, um, and I feel like there was one other one that transitioned in between baseball. And football stadiums. They weren't that great. In hindsight, especially. you When you didn't know any different, it was cool. But then you get into the football-only and baseball-only joints with the natural grass and stuff. It's where, you know, obviously then you realize that those places weren't that good. With the In, in hindsight, the phony, the, the artificial turf is ridiculous. It was carpet. Well, yeah, and I can't imagine taking a – I can't imagine playing third base on that old-school turf. Can you – that, man, <laughs> yeah. those dudes just – especially that's like in the juice era and they're not testing them. These dudes are just fully testosterone up, just ripping balls down the line. I would not be playing third base in, in Three River Stadium. That's Well, sure. how about how about tackling on that thing? That would be – you'd get rug burn all day long. I got to play a few games on, on a, a, you know, whatever you want to call it, original turf, not, not field turf now, but my – Freshman year at Ohio State, we went to Wisconsin and played, and they had the old school turf. It was, uh, you're right, it was so weird. You come off there and you have just crazy rug burns and scabs on your elbows and forearms for like th- three weeks after the game. It was, uh, it was a unique experience, but I'm glad I, got, I at least got to play a few games on it that mu- stuff. But it must have been a different game too. Does it? How it must really alter it. It must. You must run twice as fast on that kind of stuff. You can. You feel like you can run twice as fast. That's for sure. That's why. If you watch, obviously one of the greats ever, Barry Sanders, that dude indoors in Detroit on that turf. I I feel sorry for those guys trying to tackle him. <laughs> He's good enough on grass. You put him on turf, and he had the. Remember Barry had the sweet turf shoes too. I don't know yes. if they were officially called the Barry Sanders. I had a pair of them. Um, they were great, man. You put that guy was was amazing. I think. Well, that was if you look back at '80s uh, NFL games, a lot of guys wore sneakers, wore high top sneakers intended for basketball. A lot of those guys would wear those. I think they were the Adidas top tens. A lot of guys would wear and all that kind of look. And then Walter Payton got the Roos. Remember, he had the Kangaroos, his own brand. Yeah, that was. And then the ponies were big for a while, weren't they? <laughs> yeah, those were. Yeah, that was a bad look. Hawk, I want to talk to you about something Uh-oh. before we go any further. I wanted to talk to you about this, no. and we haven't real. I mean, we've now I'm getting a worried. Bit. This is making me. No, no, now. no. Okay, I just want good. to relive it. Well, I mean, I don't. I don't want to relive it. I don't want to dredge it up. Oh, I know where you're but going. Let's let's just talk briefly because I think, for my money, and I've watched you know football for several decades now. I'm not saying that was a terrible, painful loss in Seattle. I say it was nothing less than the most painful loss I've ever seen in my life. How say you? Well, since I was a part of it, yeah, it was. It was definitely. Uh, but I mean, mean, can you think of a of a game that was that was more sort of heartbreaking that you've watched and said, "Man, I can't imagine being those." Guys. I mean, watching you guys, I just thought, "How just one thing after another?" Because other games have turned in NFL history and football history on a play or two, but this was. There were six or ten plays in the fourth quarter alone that if one goes the other way, you guys still win the game. And there were just a sequence of things that just kept happening. It was it was just it was awful to watch. Heartbreaking. You're right. I mean, yeah, it's hard to to put it up there. I try not to think about it that much, Damashek. Thank you for bringing it back. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was just talking to somebody. Um, Rich Gannon and on his uh, serious show, and they were asking about it and saying like, "Can you ever move past it, or do you, does it ever? Do you ever like erase that from your mind?" I'm like, "No, those things will never leave." I mean, like, I'm sure you, as a as a fan watching the game, will never forget about that game and, and understand how crazy it was. But I was, I tell people, uh, it was like the game ended. They scored that last touchdown, and I think even us as players were like, "What just happened, man? This, there's no way this game is over." That's I remember in my mind, I was thinking. I'm like, all right, well, good. We'll get the ball back. Let's go. A Rod's gonna go get a drive and and score, and we're gonna win this thing. And like that all happened in like a split second. That went through my mind, and then I was like, oh my god, you gotta be kidding me. This game's over. So we were all in shock for a while, I think, and it's just 
You're right. So many things. There's, I don't know. If one play, uh, you know what one I, of those plays right. went the other way, you're right. It would have been I feel different. bad. I feel bad, uh, Brandon Boykin. Brandon, uh, the... the uh, yeah, I feel, I, I'm heartbroken for him that, you know, that guy, he gets, people make him the GOAT, that he fumbles a, uh, an onside kick, but that was only one of many plays. You know, the, I don't want to keep reliving it for you, but with five minutes to go in the fourth quarter, you guys picked the ball off. And when you look at the replay, you see that he could have run for a touchdown, but instead goes down. Either way, you're up, I think, what was it? Uh, I can't think of the score at that point. 19-6 or something like that. Whatever the score was, it was like, well, obviously this game is, is now over. And you get all those the, – the two killer plays to me, the ones that are hard to fathom, the two-point conversion. That was the killer. Why, M- Russell Wilson threw a moon ball across the field. I can't believe that that wound up completed. If that doesn't happen, you guys still win the game. Thinking of that now, uh, yeah, you're right. The ball was in the air forever, for days it seems like. And I don't know who, exa- who caught it. Their dude found a way to come down with it. And, yeah, it's, it's almost like you can't rank. It's hard to even rank which one was the biggest backbreaker for us. Um, I don't know. I think it was Luke Wilson who caught it. It was weird. I yeah. can't remember the DB on the play, but it looked like he was. Oh, uh, it was. Uh, it was Ha Ha. Mm-hmm. It looked like he just was sort of deceived. Like, well, how do you play a ball that's that high up in the air? I, I could get in the way of it, but it's coming from an angle that I've never seen a, a past football come from. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I don't even know how to. If you're right, if you try to think about going back, uh, I haven't. I haven't sat there and watched the TV copy. Um, like I'm sure a lot of people have. And then think about that. So Seattle takes that, takes that to the Super Bowl, and they're on the one-yard line going to win. And then their whole ordeal happens with, with the pick uh, on first, throwing a, a pick on first down from the one-yard line going in. And that, that just made me – that just threw me for a complete loop. I, I watched not all the game. I was kind of in and out, bopping, bopping, bobbing and weaving. It's tough to watch the game when you know you sure. feel like you could have been there. And um, – I remember seeing that. I'm like, oh, man, Seattle won another Super Bowl. Jeez. And then, boom, the pick happens, and I'm thinking, like, gee, I, I don't know. That was just – that had to kill Seattle people just because I'm thinking the, the type of way they beat us in the NFC Championship game, it, it, I immediately start thinking, like, man, these guys are like – maybe it just wasn't meant to be for us or whatever. You try to just justify it somehow, and then – Seattle's going on like they're going to go, and this is their destiny. It's going to change the whole franchise forever. Win another one, and then boom, Tom Brady gets his fourth ring. So you could never really write it up. The you way were, it turns you out. were, but you were happy though. Be honest, you were happy that the Seahawks didn't win. If I, they could I, deal I, you that that pain, then they should suffer themselves. I, don't, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I was really like indifferent. I was, um, I didn't care because. Uh, I don't know. I don't really have it. I didn't have any ties really to either team. A lot of times I'll have buddies on, on one of the teams or I didn't, I had guys I knew and, and I was friends with on, on both sides, but I wasn't really like torn. And I, I really, I didn't, I don't know. It was so weird. It was just such a weird way to end the year. And then, I mean, I, I had an idea. I, did, I, I kind of knew at the time, like there was a good chance I wasn't going to be back in Green Bay. So that was even, it wasn't even like once I realized we weren't going to go to the Super Bowl and win, it was just a weird couple months even thinking about, things like that like the game and I was so just like it was like the game was on in the, in the background for me I didn't really care I hear I you I was the, when I knew you guys were really the football gods were against you and I do think you still would have won the game but when you lose the coin toss that's it the, the, the overtime I was like that, just nothing can go their way now all of a sudden <laughs> that was it and uh the question I've wanted that I, I I'm fascinated by is so what happens on the plane you guys get a what? What was it like? Is everybody just silent, or do you guys have some beers and have some fun? You can't you have that, you can't have you can't drink on the planes. Now. I mean, they don't. I think they took coaches. They used to serve the coaches alcohol up front in first class back in the day, and they stopped that. What? Up. They don't serve booze on no on on, on what? in the NFL. What? No way, man. Um, I think it was baseball that changed everything. When do you remember when a guy? I think a guy got drunk in the clubhouse and took off, and he might have died. Got a yeah, uh, man, I think, yeah, I think a guy died years ago, how many years ago, and so they took alcohol out of the clubhouses in baseball, supposedly, then, and they never had it, like, it, it's not like old school, 
the old school tough guy football is there's no booze anywhere in our locker room, on our planes, anything. I mean, if guys don't try to sneak it in, but you don't really ever see that happening either. So at least in Green Bay, you didn't. So now um, I'm not as sad that I never got to play pro football. Yeah, you no booze on the planes. That's yeah, how is that? Yeah, you're right. You're right. So what has? So tell me, what's it like? Was it like a three hour flight? What what goes on? Oh yeah, your- almost four hours back to Green Bay from Seattle. Um, it's like I, I started. Even, I thought about this a little bit ago, thinking that flight's terrible whether you win or lose. Because if you win, you're like, oh man, let's get back. We're going to the Super Bowl. We want to get back so bad. And if you lose, it's just a horrendous feeling going back there. You know your season's ending. And it happened like that. But um, it's really quiet, at least for us. It was um, just like real quiet when we first get on and guys kind of sit down and get settled and, I don't know, eat and you'll eat a little bit. And some guys might play cards a little bit here or there. But it never really it never really gets much talking until like maybe the last like hour or so of the flight when we're starting to, starting to go down. I think guys will maybe just talk a little bit, trying to figure out like what happened maybe or just – talk about what they're going to do in the off season and just basically in disbelief. I think all of us were in disbelief. There was, there was a big group of fans at the, at the airport in Green Bay waiting for us, I know, and I'm sure they were just crushed because they would have been lining from the hmm. jetway out to the parking lot if we'd have won. Um, so I'm sure they were dying, but they were there to support us. And So I guess that, that felt a little bit better with the seeing them, but it almost made me feel worse. Like, man, what did we do to these people? There, these these <laughs> nice these nice people. These nice people were gonna were probably already here. You know, they thought we had the game in hand. And they're already waiting. And then boom, Seattle Seattle took. Wow, it from us. I'm sorry to uh, I'm sorry to bring that stuff up. I've been fascinated <laughs> to hear. I, I just thought what that must be for players because you do hear you see like Gronkowski after the Super Bowl, the first Super Bowl that he lost. And he, uh, you know, you remember that, like that he was out dancing, He's dancing or whatever at their, that their night, you know, post game party. Fans are, you know, fans of the Patriots were were upset, like we're devastated, we're crying in our homes, and you're out dancing, man. Yeah, like what do you, what's the, what's he supposed to do, you know? What? I don't know. He's a young guy, just finished. Now that tell you for what, the year basically. Now they're eating it up. Now, now they don't care what he does. They won. <laughs> right. the winning, winning changes a lot of things. That's for sure. Man, yeah, I don't know. I'm believe me, I don't. I'm okay talking about it. It was a uh, terrible losing. I've lo- I've lost two NFC Championship games now, and they're never easy. They're brutal. Or one of them we lost at Lambeau Field to the Giants back in my second year. So yeah, they're all brutal, man. They're all tough to. to oh, is handle. that the Favre? That's the Favre throws the pick in overtime. Yeah, that, that was his last game uh, as a Packer. Oh, that was that was a glorious one to look at, though. It looked like it was it was minus twenty or whatever, right? And it, yeah, went, it was brutal. It looked cold. that way on TV. It looked frigid. It did. Yeah. Do you uh, do you know Michael Strahan at all? No, I've never met him. Okay, so I don't. I've only just run into him a few times. Been on when he was at the Super Bowl a year ago at a Fox show or whatever. But I remember like seeing him, and he that was his. He went and won a Super Bowl, and then he kind of rode off into the sunset after that. So they won, and I remember telling my wife later, I was like, "Man, you under, you understand why guys make play for a long time, or why good things are happening to him now, and why he's just transitioned into you know crazy media star." Yeah. Um, outside of football, he was so they they hit a field goal to win the game basically on us, um, draining the field goal, and they all the whole Giants team came ran, run on the field, and I'm just like instantly started booking for the locker room, and I remember one of their little wideouts was like took his helmet off and was like dancing all stupid, like weird, too, like taunting our crowd, almost trying to taunt our our bench even as a running off, and I was like just kind of glanced at him like yeah, whatever man, like you can't say anything, you just got beat by them. But then Strahan was staying there. I remember he, like, stopped multiple of us, multiple guys, stopped me and, like, shook our hand and said, like, good luck, said, like, great game or whatever. And I was like, for some reason, even at the time, it was brutal to handle that loss. But I remembered that, and I was like, this dude's a true pro. Like, I was – I really had a lot of respect for that. I don't even know if I've said that to anyone but my wife, but it was it was a cool thing that I, I'll always remember, I think. I, I've never got to tell him that, but – whenever you get to talk to him, when you, and when you have him on your podcast, let him know that he's, a, he's a classy individual. That- <laughs> I'll let him know. That's a cool. I I, I do like uh, a li- I, I like those stories like that. I love to find out who the good guys are, who the cool guys in pro football are. You know. Um, well, who's your okay? Then who's your? Uh, I don't know if you would. Who is your all time favorite player that did not play for the Steelers? Because I know you'll just name fourteen players for the Steelers if I give you that option. What if I say AJ Hawk? Well, 
You gotta Does take that me make out you of uncomfortable? Yeah, because that's not that's just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Player to watch or who uh, I think is a cool guy. Um, okay, let's say who was your favorite? You know, no, just cool guy. No one cares about who on the field. Like that's stupid. Like there's a yeah. I mean, I liked I liked watching uh, Walter Payton when I was a kid. Yeah. I thought it was fun to watch. Nice guys. Yeah, who was like a good guy that maybe people don't know was a good guy? You know who's one of the nicest guys is Michael Robinson, the former Penn State QB, who you once said was the hardest quarterback you've ever had to try to tackle, college or pro, which he was very flattered by. He's he's about as nice as it gets. Nate Burleson, the the wideout now works at uh, the NFL. I'll tell you, big star who people may, you know, maybe don't have a sense of is... um, Ladanian Tomlinson is a is a sweetheart of a guy, really nice. And the thing that's funny about LT that I bet people don't know is he's not just he's he's a big NBA fan. A lot of a lot of athletes like to talk uh, about other sports. That's a weird thing for a fan is to realize. I probably do on some level. You care about your teammates on that year's team, but I care about the team. I care more about the Pittsburgh Steelers than probably a guy who they drafted in the third round two years ago cares. Even though he's getting paid by them, he's, you know, his paycheck and his teammates require that he cares what happens to that year's team. But I'm invested. I want the Steelers to win the title, you see. <laughs> you know, that, that's the disconnect for, for fans. So it's cool when guys do care about the franchise because they're entrenched with that team. You know, when they're there for a while and... and develop some sort of uh, rapport with the fans but LT so he's a big San Diego guy loves that loves that really charitable guy and all that kind of stuff but what's fun with him is he loves NBA ball he loves talking NBA and is deeply knowledgeable about it so he's fun guy um okay who's the guy that Warren Sapp is surprisingly uh, you know to some people I've I you know Sapp uh, and I always got along uh, famously he's gone right Yes, he's not there anymore, but uh, he's a good guy. And they, I, I'll tell you this, QBs, by, as a position, NFL QBs, I'm not going to say they're not nice guys, but they have, been, have it pounded into their head from the day they arrive, if not before, that they're, they're basically like, they're like political figures. They, they, they're political candidates. You're not running for senator. You can answer... My questions, but they're so nervous about bulletin board material, and I see why completely. If you, the only guy who seems like who's been around for any amount of time and is still acts like him, acts like a regular fella, is Philip Rivers. He's you know still cracks wise and has fun. Everybody else though is so measured in everything they say. <laughs> Hey, what are you excited? Hey, Russell Wilson, is it is it exciting? Because you're you grew up. You say you're a big Drew Brees fan. Is it cool to get to play against him? I'm looking forward to an opportunity to win a game. <laughs> I thought, I'm looking forward to go one and zero. That's what I want every week. Like, all right, but still, isn't it? But isn't it cool? Hey, you know, I have great respect for him, and we're looking forward to the challenge. Like, all right, then, take it, just take it one day at a time, one play at a time. And yeah, just, that you, yeah. you know, I can't take. I can't. Yeah, how take, do you? Okay, how do you interview a guy to? to to ask a, a broadcast guru like yourself, say you're yeah. honestly talking. I, I've heard people say, and I agree with them, that some of the hardest interviews to conduct are, say, is to interview either a kid or an athlete, a pro athlete, because they're both usually terrible to interview and tough to, like, little kids are going to give you <laughs> one word answers, you know, yeah, yes, oh, I like chocolate, you know, and just be tough to interview. And then athletes are usually entitled and think they're doing you a favor the whole time. Like, oh, why am I talking to this guy? You know, and I've, I've seen, I've been around that my whole life and seen it, but who, uh, how do you, what do you do? Like, not, let's say a guy's not a bad guy, but he's like, uh, say it's a, a cliche dude that just well, is so worried to step off the track, cause he, you know, don't want to ruin an endorsement deal or whatever. How do you handle an interview like that? Poke him. You poke him. That's what you do. You just keep, bu- you, you, you just, uh, you give him the business. That's, I really, I mean, that's, you, you you don't uh, let them get away with. I can see that now from being on your your podcast multiple times. I can see that now. Because I, I, I tell them to cut it out. That's you call what them I out. Do. You're I, right. You call yeah. If you, if I like give you any kind of political answer, not even political. If I just try to give you a, a just a run of the mill normal answer, that you like cut me off halfway into the answer. It's great. I love it actually. Well, so yeah, that's a, yeah. The perfect uh, uh, an easy example is. Uh, 
you know, the a classic kind of question from five or ten years ago. Who's better, Tom Brady or Peyton Manning? Oh, they're both great professionals, and it's an honor to play in the league with them. Like, I'll be quiet, but who would you be more scared <laughs> to play in a big game? Well, well, that's the answer. That's how you answer the question. Yeah, but like you said, you understand why they, they, they are measured yeah. like that. And it's, it's true. It's like I, I look at it as a, just a, a fan of football, a fan of sports. It, yeah, I want to hear a guy. I like. I, I I get. I think it's funny to see a guy like Gronk out there going crazy, you know, and having a great time. And it, it's like the thing you said. They lost the Super Bowl, and he there's a video of him dancing. And everyone's all mad at him. Like, what do you you what do you what do you want from him? Like, you now you're celebrating this, and everyone that's all they want to do is get a glimpse of him at the victory parade, dancing and going crazy, and throw a beer to him and all this stuff. But then if you if he does it at a time that you don't feel is right, then you're gonna get mad at him. It's the same thing with answers. Like, I don't know. That's a weird – I wouldn't know how to answer some of those questions that you have. Well, like, I – Comparing I think quarterbacks were, and stuff, that'd be tough. Yeah, no, I know. But, yeah, and, and, and well, the, the, the pat answer that you'll get is, hey, what do you think's going on with um, – do you, do you think the, the Cowboy – anything that is glancingly controversial. Hey, what do you think about the Cowboys signing Greg Hardy? Well, I, I don't involve myself in what other franchises are doing. You've given me that business before. In fact, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I have. I may be, I mean, I'll tell you if I, really, I don't. I don't really know if I should be talking about other teams. That's not my business. Well, no, I'll say if I if I'm not knowledgeable on a subject or I don't know anything about it, I'll tell you. Like, I don't. I honestly don't know because I don't know anything about what's going on in other teams. I know what's going on with me. That's about it. With my buddies well, around me. Well, what I can tell you is that uh, yeah, I think that a lot of guys like to. Um, uh, be dodgy about that kind of stuff but i think well no i don't think guys want to be dodgy i think all of you want to answer questions like anybody else why wouldn't you want to tell the truth about what you think about something but the teams have figured the teams have made you feel like you're being disloyal or you're bringing uh, un, uh attention we, the kind of attention we don't want on the team if you go and shoot your mouth off so you're scared to do it but, of course, from a business standpoint, somebody like you, look at you. Now you're doing your own show and all this. Of course, if you don't tell the truth, if you don't shoot from the hip, then, then there's no value to and it. No one's gonna, why would anyone watch me just sit here and talk about, like... Yeah, I mean, talking cliché. We're, we're 27 minutes into this. This is the most we've talked. I've talked sports in, like, 22 episodes. That's why I wanted to have you on. I'm trying to get some sports guys here and there, too. So. I don't care. Don't talk sports. Oh, no, we, we are. Come on. Don't get mad at me. It's all right. I know you're a Pittsburgh tough guy. Don't get me. try to fight me, Damashek. You see that? You see what that is? I can <laughs> drop that any time, Hawk. Now, you listen. Bring that haymaker yeah, from the coal mine. I know. You. We don't have coal mines in Pittsburgh. We have steel, steel mills. We don't even bad. have those. Steel mills. Ohio, coal, coal mills. Coal mines are in Ohio. My bad. That's right. Yeah. We, the real by the way, guys. you're from Ohio. The I think maybe you should are. be the spokesman for that state. Explain <laughs> this to me. Why does explain this thing- to me? I'm sorry to cut you off. Why is that your radio voice you're speaking in? Yeah. What are you talking? When you about? raise it like really high up, do you speak to your family like that? Like what? Like that? Like this? Yeah. Yes, I talk to everybody. This I mean, you way. have. I love your energy. Believe me, I had Billy Corbin, the documentary filmmaker, on here, and his energy was amazing. I was like, I got Damashek. We're just like a one-two punch of just crazy energy and passion. It's going to be awesome. I'm excited. But what kind of thing is that? What, what, what would I say? What if I? What do you mean? Do I talk? This I mean, way? like, what do I talk your, like your in my real voice? My real voice is this, AJ. I yeah. just think it's more noticeable for me to talk. Is that how you you parent your children <laughs> in that voice? <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't really. It's but do you not have as to, intimidating as a dad should be? I guess. Is there such a thing as like a, a dude like having to ter- like you? Do you feel like you have to if you're going on camera, or say you're recording one of your podcasts? Do you have to like turn it on and bring, like snap into this weird fake like weatherman voice? No, because I because yeah. Well, there are a lot of comedians who you can see. I've I've you know have done shows. Not at the NFL, but previously when I was doing, like, I was Adam Carolla's sidekick on the radio for a while. And it's funny when some comedians, and, oh, I used to write on Crank Yankers, too. And so that some of those comedians are, they do flip a switch. You know, they're, 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 they're super low-key. Bob Odenkirk, you know, uh, yeah. Better Call Saul. Of course. Is super serious, low-key pretty intense guy not really engaging and friendly and affable but as soon as it's time to perform he's you know he's a he's a funny sarcastic sort of a guy it's interesting to see who those people are like tracy but you know what it is it's people who 
it, you know, if the reason I do this is because this is the way I am. Whereas, but there's some funny people who are funny because they can turn a great phrase. They can come up with a joke in a split second. So I guess you can see those guys have to flip a switch to be on and ready to roll. But if you're uh, an ass like me, intrinsically, then no change necessary. Or major overhaul necessary, and I'm too lazy to, to make it. Well, that's why, that's why people like you, though, is because you're you. You know, you're not, you're not playing a character, even though you are you're high energy, high passion. Guys, people see that, and they like it. And I remember going on your podcast for the first time, man, what do you think, probably four years ago, I think I called Something it. Something like that. Yeah, it was like four years ago, and I had no idea what was uh, even happening. Uh, I thought it was something for – NFL.com, which I know they carry your podcast. So I'm like, all right, this what is this like a okay, it's gonna be like an interview. And I, I don't know what was going on at the time. I don't I don't know something. What's it gonna be an interview? Yeah. Like, I, usually when you get on the phone to NFL, that's usually what it's gonna be. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well it's gonna I be an like, interview. I thought I don't know what was happening at the time. I think it was it was right before the season was starting, and I think I don't know what was happening. We're like someone I just got off the phone or like a couple of days before that, I think someone like some guy was so weird and like douchey to me, telling like asking me if I was gonna like make the team that year and all. I remember I was like, what, "Do you know something? I don't know, buddy. Like, what are you? Hmm. What's going on? Like, it was weird." So I think when I went on, I was gonna go on yours. I'm like, "All right, what? I was, what's happening out there?" Because I don't go and read anything on myself or whatever. And I'm thinking, I was like, "All right, sure, I'll I'll do it." I'm like, "Wonder what what kind of awesome questions this dude's gonna have." And I'd heard of your name. I just didn't know you personally at the time. And it was amazing, man. It was awesome. Like, I had so much fun going on there with you. We talked football, but we talked all kind of stuff. I still remember it was the time when – it was the time when Dane Cook got in trouble on stage. Not Dane Cook, my bad. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Tosh. Uh, Tosh. Oh, yeah, yeah, Tosh yeah. Tosh made – like, I... didn't Tosh make a rape joke to a girl or something? And she went home and blogged about it. It was – I, I don't know why I remember us talking about that. Because Rank was on there. And Rank's a comedian, right? Yes. Adam Rank. And so we got it talking into stand up and all this stuff. And it was just awesome. It was fun. Um, so that's when I, my first, uh, my first meeting with you, at least on, on the air. And it was cool, man. It was like one of my first, uh, segues into like the whole podcast world too. And I, shortly after that, I started listening to a bunch of them. And so maybe I, your, do, I do have you to thank for, for your me. best appearance ever was when we were talking, cause you like to talk movies and we like to talk <laughs> movies and TV shows was when we broke down um, Captain Phillips and <laughs> what, what, what goes on with those pirates. How did, I mean, again, I, I, that movie still plays on cable all the time. I think it's fascinating that that giant ship with whatever's on, what is it, oil? I don't even remember what's what are on they, it. What were they, t- they didn't, I don't, did they even ever say what they were hauling? I don't, I, I can't recall if we know. I, yeah. Maybe they explained but that that little dinghy boat thing can catch up yeah. to a ship. But fine, you still have what amounts to like five stories or more to get up to get onto the deck of the ship. Why? How does that ladder work? Why doesn't somebody just stand there, as we discussed, with a big hammer and knock bonk them <laughs> on the head as they come up one by one? I know. I remember. Yeah, we, we talked about that. I think I said, I, man, I, it's like it's all coming back to me. I think I said something. We, should, we just have big, big bowls of snakes and pour them on those guys as they're climbing the ladder. <laughs> Like why don't they like or like the remember the old school castles they'd have like over the entrance if they if they breach the door they'd dump like burning hot tar on them tar right yeah what about that like why don't you gotta have some kind of things in uh, in place I think to keep those dudes off like how do the dudes fight through the wake of the monster ship and get on that you're right like you gotta do something about that. What? I mean fine so you're not military guys you're shipping guys so what they're, they're, you you don't know how to. To drop stuff on people? <laughs> you don't understand the concept of gravity? Just drop heavy things on them as they're trying to climb up the ladder. Then, then they're done. Or how about this? Unhook the ladder. Who just lets the ladder hook there forever? Oh, well, the pirates are trying to come up. Leave the hooks. It'd be rude to nope. hook. We're screwed, guys. Go hide in the back room. <laughs> All you have to do is, yeah, unhook the ladder, let it fall into the sea, and the problem is solved. What are they going to do You're there? right. They'll get, they got their bodies get chopped up in the prop. You're right. But we, man, why not? Or, like, if you would have, if they would have just thrown an iPhone and hit him in the forehead, they would have fallen off into the water probably. Those little dudes, yeah. remember those little pirates? They're like 130 pounds. They should have been easy, and we're supposed to be impressed 
by American might at the end of the movie. It took 17 <laughs> battleships to take down those four characters, those underfed characters. They've been on the ship for four days in that little yellow thing, that yellow submarine thing. They haven't eaten a morsel of food, and we have to dispatch our entire military force to undo what they are trying to do to this Captain Phillips. It's shameful. Now, speaking of shameful, what I wanted to ask you, though, about Ohio as the chief representative of the state. Well, yeah, what? there's just a little pesky guy named LeBron. I think he might have that title. Are you now a LeBron fan? Well, I mean, I've always been a, Le a LeBron guy. He's one year younger than me. I watched him play in high school and everything. So, I mean, I'm always a supporter of him. I didn't. I never jumped ship when he went to Miami. I didn't, like, turn on him. I, I understood. Well, see, that's, again, that's what I'm telling you. You guys, you professional athletes, you don't understand the, there is an inverse relationship between if you're if you're a fan like me, yes. your athleticism very often works in in inverse relationship with how much you care about watching other people play sports. I like watching sports because I can't do it myself, so I'm uh, I'm amazed by it. Whereas I think a lot of guys in your position, are kind of like, yeah, it's cool, and I understand the business of it, and LeBron can go to Miami if he wants. He's a grown man. But we fans are, are outraged by the disloyalty with things like that. How dare he go to South Beach? Were you one of those guys that said, how dare he go to South Beach? I think in that case in particular, I think he was mismanaged. I think it was a good call. In fact, he really could have been a hero um, for the proletariat, for the working man, because what he really did was – cast aside the need for GMs and agents and everything else, he, Chris Bosh, and Dwayne Wade put their heads together. The working class of the NBA puts their heads together, and they decide to form a superpower without the help of GMs and owners and all that sort of stuff. This should have been something for, the, for proletariat and anti-bourgeoisie. <laughs> ah, but, but, but instead, he mishandled it by doing, the, I'm taking my talent to South Beach, that was obnoxious, the whole not one, not two, not three, that was obnoxious. All that stuff undid it, but if you look at the bones of it, it was cool. He said, well, you know what, I'm not going to be traded around by, by a billionaire. Me and these two guys who play ball are going to figure it out for ourselves. I thought it was cool. It was. I, I, I have no problem with him going. Obviously, the whole whatever decision thing he did on TV was, was stupid, like that – I don't even know why you – I think they said – didn't they say they they donated the money from the commercials to a charity yeah. or whatever, which is cool. It's really cool if you did that. But no one – people still will hold on to that, especially Ohio people and Cleveland people. But then look at it. He comes back, and it's like city is saved. They're going to bring in $7 billion a week now in new revenue because he's back and they're putting billboards up. So it worked out absolutely perfect for him. He got a championship, and now he's back. And if he wins one in Cleveland – I mean, I don't. Where can he go from there? Is he going to run for president? What's he going to do? I don't know, but yeah, I think it's I, what you should have done is really emulated that and said, and you should have held a press conference in the last few weeks or so, and just said, "I'm pleased to announce that I'm taking my talents to the Queen City," <laughs> and then just put this on your head, and people would have gone wild across the land. And we'll ha I have Diddy, and then that lady that sings with him, the Coming Home song. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> my, that kids, been cool. my kids love that show or that song um, what you should do but here's what i'd the answer ohio with all due respect it's your homeland and all that and i you know i know that uh um the hawk clan is proud of you and your old man who i still want to talk to um at some point but explain this to me <clears throat> the only thing good about ohio in the 19th century at least was that the only reason it, it, may, it, it could last is because you had the commerce created by the Ohio River, right? Otherwise, it's a, it's, a, it's a useless state. And on the other side of the border, on the Pennsylvania side, glorious rolling hills and, you know, the, the steel that was forged <laughs> back in W. That's right. You want to laugh about that. You know what's not so funny is what Mussolini and Hitler and Japan wanted to do to us. You know who had the answer? The good people of Pittsburgh, PA, A.J. Hawk. They pulled together. They forged the steel that made the tanks and the ships that <laughs> defeated the Third Reich. 
If you don't like Pittsburgh, you don't like America. You know, Hawk? <laughs> you, make a, you make a valid point, but guess what was powering all of their machinery? Everything they were, they were doing was being powered by the coal that was taken out of the, uh, the caves and hills of Ohio. So I don't know. know about that. But so they what couldn't, I do Pittsburgh could not have, have done all that without the help of Ohio. Well, let me tell you this. You know what you wouldn't have without the help of Pittsburgh? You wouldn't have your Ohio River. You know the yeah. Ohio River. Why is it called the Ohio? And they, you know River? they ruin it. They ruin. Um, I was uh, no joke. You're gonna think I'm making this up. I was so I was at Paul Brown Stadium like a week ago, and I'm looking at the river, and there's like a bunch of like floating logs and just debris coming down the middle, and I'm like, what's what is is that always here? Is it like do people like can you go like wakeboarding and stuff out there? They're like, oh no, it's pretty dirty. You don't want to get out there. You don't want to be like in the water. And they're like. We get all that from Pittsburgh. They, that's what we get from them is all this debris right. and broken wood and steel and barrels and just garbage they ship down the river. And that's so right, I, but that's not an accident. That doesn't, it doesn't happen by chance. We do that on purpose, so you get it. That's our, that's our ongoing FU to the Bengals. Is it, that's what we find do. A way, we need to find a way to, to you know, have a guy engineer the river to flow back towards Pittsburgh. Is that possible? Well, no. Anyone ever done no. that? No, well, because you know why. Why it's called the Ohio River is my issue. Yeah. It shouldn't be called that at all. It's formed when the, Ohio, when the Allegheny and Monongahela converge where? On the banks of Pittsburgh. Why do you get the river? It should be the, it should be the Steel Curtain River or something like that. The Lambert River. The, the Mean Lambert. Joe River. Yeah. What about the Cordell Stewart River? The Cor- right? I, you beat me to the punch. I was about to say the Cordell. <laughs> or how about the Bubby River? I don't know. What, one of those would have been good. Uh, uh, Carnell Lake. Is that right? Yeah, Carnell, go Carnell, Carnell Lake River would be. Carnell, no, you know who they, they can name it? The Kevin Green River. I played, with that. I played for him. That guy's a, he's a machine, but he was only there a couple years, really. With but the he, pack you play. Oh, that's right. He went, uh, he was, he was outside coach backers, up there, right? Yeah, he coached the outside backers. I was inside, but he, uh, yeah, he's an intense dude, man. He loves the people of Pittsburgh. But hold on, Damashek, before you completely hijack my show. I'm sorry. As, which is fine. I knew that would happen. That's why I wanted to have you on. Um. So you're a, you're a, whatever your title is, I have no idea what you, what would you call yourself now? Like, what is your job title with NFL Network? Uh, you like, know, it's a good question. Like a I business card. Do you have a business card? No. Let's figure out what I should lay. I should get one business card and then two, let's figure out what I should do. What, what would have the most impact? Either, oh man, maybe like with this nice Pittsburgh dark black beard you have which i don't know if you die do you dye that or is that just natural yeah really i die dark? yeah i die at hawk i dye my beard now that's <laughs> the pittsburgh yeah, some, the pittsburghians would grease. disown you i got grecian formula to looks jazz good, up though. my your, beard your beard looks great though but yeah. um, i look so, like franco harris people say <laughs> exactly if people well your cards either got to have just a picture of your just your big head and face on there with no words or Ooh, something like I'd... just your last name, obviously Damashek, just Damashek, and then I don't know, man. Like it's, I don't know. That's we'll, we'll figure that one out. But I don't know. I do. I you know, uh, writer isn't right. Talent always seems weird. And when you fill out on whatever applications or whatever, yeah, what do you, you put? You have to fill those. Well, what do you do? You put football player? Uh, I try not to, but I'll put. I'll never put football player. If I put anything, I'll, if they make me put something, I'll put athlete. But I mean, anyone could put athlete. My, my dad can put athlete. I might start doing that. I athlete. think you should put athlete. I Yeah, I don't know what my official title would be. Talent always seems weird to write down. It should be talent. Uh, that's what I wanted to get into, though. So performer, you're former. You're on. Know. You have a podcast. You have you're, you're showing up on shows all the time. But you, do you have like any like specific or um, like your schedule? Do you have like a laid out schedule or is it just so it seems like it just flows and changes every week every day like when you're on a show when you're hosting a show when you're i don't know doing your podcast like when you're writing and posting something like what what's your schedule uh it it really is all over the place but it's weird that it doesn't my my assumption was well in the off season you'll have you know be like being a teacher in summertime you'll you know you'll have uh, all sorts of downtime but no the sea you know with weird I, it, but i like it it's fun to me um, that it really is that pro football just goes year round now. You can really get away with if you would have said if I you know ten years ago, hey, if you work for the NFL, what do you imagine it would be like? Um, I would you know like I say, I would think I'd have plenty of time. I, I I it's weird how I don't know about college basketball anymore. Filling out my brackets this year, I had no idea. I mean, I was like, 
Oklahoma's a three seed? I had no <laughs> idea. You could have told me they went uh, five and 28 this year. I have no idea who's good or bad in, in any sport. You're wearing a Columbus Blue Jackets uh, shirt mm-hmm. there. I know the Penguins are pretty good, and I, I've watched them play a few times, but you know, if you would have told 10 years ago me that, I would have said, shame the devil. He sold out. He doesn't know what the Penguins are doing, but it is weird. I, don't, I, I, I do work all year, but to answer your specific question, yeah, I mean, I do a couple podcasts a week. I try to shoot video. What I want to do, though, is re- really the dream gig is to talk at length with the likes of you and the other fun guys in the league. Do it all the time. Just every, anywhere there's a football discussion to be had, that's where I go, and I want to sit and get to and get to hear what really goes on. I don't care as much about like those questions about like, so you guys are on a two game losing streak here. How are you going to get out of that funk? You know, like that. Yeah, you're not going to get a real answer. There is no real answer to that. I'm like, oh, we're going to play better. We're going to score more points than them. Like, what do you say? There's that's why, but th- that's why I think your podcast is so good, and why it's good for a guy like you too. Like you said, you want to talk at length, and that's why I love podcasts. You can actually talk, and you have to like. I mean, if you sit here and lie and, and put on a, a character the whole time, you're gonna. My my buddy Aubrey said on here, you're you're a psychopath if you can find a way to do that. But <laughs> that's not really fit. It doesn't fit the whole model of TV though. Right now, when you like thirty minute show and you have you know a six minute segment and then you got to go to break and then a four minute segment, like you can't. And you have four guys on the panel. You can't really say what you need to say or want to. Like, how do you handle that? Well, it's what it's one worse too, is because of course there are production meetings in advance. You've done that stuff before, where they say, "All right, so then the host is going to ask you who you think is the best team in the, in the oh, AFC right brutal, now," and, and and then and then you'll go and we'll run we'll run B roll of the team. So who's it going? Who are you going to say there? You're going to say the Patriots. Okay, who do you think's best on the Patriots? Tom Brady. Okay, so we'll have some film clips of Tom Brady while you're telling why you think they're the best rolling. And so it, it then it pigeonholes you into that. There's nothing you can't change your answer if the guy <laughs> sitting next to you says something. You're like, you know what? It's interesting. Now he makes me think about it. I re- if you do that, then the producer's in your ear. No, no, no. Talk Patriots. Talk Patriots. you got to stick to that. And you have 20 or 30 seconds to do it. Yes, this is where it's at. But the good news is for you and me, Hawk, is that more and more this is where things are going. They're, the, you know, It's much more about digital stuff. It's much more about... Uh, you know, uh, online. It's about, on demand you know, now. Everything's on YouTube, demand. YouTube, right. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Where if people want to see or hear you, they, they can dial it up at any time and watch past episodes, and people, you know, will do them live, too. Um, and then they, you know, they're in their archive to, to listen to. That's what I do. I listen to, yeah, stuff every night. But, um, like, how, I don't know. I, that, that just kills me how, listening to you talk about that. I, it, it almost gives me nightmares. Of the, it's also fun. I mean, I know I make it sound brutal. Yeah, it's not. It is rigid. It's, I mean, yeah, it's, I'm not picking up heavy stuff or anything like that. But, but comparing the two things, this is definitely more mm-hmm. fun because, you, you, you know, you get the, if something, if you say something interesting that, uh, that piques my interest or vice versa, we can spend the next 20 minutes talking about it. Whereas if you do that, on TV, there's you know you can't even acknowledge it. You have to just keep moving. What well, yeah? What do you think about that? that? That brings me. It makes me think about these dudes that, who people people talk about um, guys like like a Skip Bayless or what uh, Stephen A. Smith, dudes like that um, that seem to just you know I don't know if they I don't know if they even enjoy what they're how they're portrayed or what they are saying, but they're they're so that's their role now is being like this inflammatory dude that just just go out there and say crazy things and, you know, kind of kill people. Um, what, uh, what are your thoughts on guys like that and shows like that that just argue one-on-one back and forth all day? I know, and it's also, well, and, and uh, I'd throw Cowherd into that mix too, which is that it's, you know, it, from a uh, you know, money-making standpoint, obviously, they're not complaining. They're, they're all millionaires, and so from that standpoint, I'm sure they're happy and willing to do to whatever it takes to keep that going, but... It, that, like you say, it's insincere. Basically, their model is, and and I've talked with uh, the the people around them, and uh, you know enough to to know how they do it. And in fact, talked to one or two of those guys directly, and they will say it's about going against what the majority of people are are saying. So they'll take whatever the subject is and try and 
dig their heels in and defend the unpopular side of a thing. Even if they really, don't believe it, you mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They definitely do not believe it. Yeah. I mean, there are some. I mean, I don't know what Stephen A. Smith believes, but I know Bayless and Cowherd will go out of their way to take the minority opinion just because they know it'll get heat. It'll it'll draw attention for them to do that. But you know, if that, and obviously, if they're successful doing it, then then who cares what I think about it? But it's just that that. What what kind of foundation is that to build your thing on? That you're going to jive? Like, well, so then what 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 would I ever believe? What why would I care what your opinion is on anything if if I can deduce that that's what you're doing? Yeah, it's a weird world. I don't um, like I said. I, I I'm so into like how everything where everything's going with on demand and online and finding what I want that I don't really I don't. It's just not. I've never really been interested in in. Uh, shows like that too much but i know people have strong opinions on both sides about those shows but and i always wonder what other media guys think of it and it's like if those guys wanted to change and wanted to like be completely authentic and be real now it's too they, they can't it wouldn't it's like the producers wouldn't like that they wouldn't have a show anymore and so have you seen have you been in places where producers and execs will tell guys specifically like what okay hey here, we want you to debate, let's just say, for example, any, like a player like Donovan McNabb. You, we want you to say, you say why you think he's one of the greatest Philly quarterbacks ever, and I want you to say why he's terrible. Like, does that happen? Yeah, that, I, I, I've heard that, yeah, that they'll say, we, you know, we'd like you to, be, to not agree. I know, yeah, if got, you know, guys are picking games, if everybody picks one side, you know, hey, let's say hey, the Steelers are playing the Ravens in this playoff game. If everybody picks the Steelers, they'll push somebody. Hey, pick, somebody pick the Ravens. Somebody bite that bullet so we aren't uh, across the board the same. But, I, yeah, definitely. Pardon the interruption. Do you think it's an accident that 15 years of doing that show, those two guys have never agreed on one subject? I mean, they, they all – one takes one side, the other takes the other. Yeah, it's – it's, um, yeah, I've seen people do that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, the other thing to consider is, too, it's funny. I've also been around people who can't – conjure those opinions when put on the spot it's like hey what do you think of subject a is is that guy good or bad well there are only two answers to anything you know like a, yeah. in, in, in in these sports debates there really is rarely uh an option c there's certain you know you lose in when you listen to sports radio and stuff the nuance is often lost in these things there is uh there i guess there is an answer c somewhere in between but a lot of the time is that guy good or is he bad is is that team the best or is that team the best those kind of debates choose one and defend it it's a, to me it's not really it's not a hard thing to to come up with it's fine to to do that if you like arguing with people it's a it's a fun uh it's a fun practice to get into but uh, to to argue with people um but it's not hard you know yeah to, to, to you, all you have to do is pick a side take one or the other and defend it you're crazy if you disagree with me. Pick any subject. What should we argue? What color's better? Orange or green? You go, Hawk. Orange. Are you orange? <laughs> what, yes. are, what, what are we talking about? Ice cream or are we talking about the color? Green makes green is the color of grass. Green is the color of trees. We wouldn't have oxygen without the color green. What's orange ever give? I mean, just, just argue your point. You're crazy if you're if you disagree. That's why. That's why I'm I'm worried about my future broadcasting. I just I'm terrible at that. I started to get uncomfortable thinking you were going to try to make me come back with what and defend orange. <laughs> All right, like, now defend orange. Yeah, say right. it's the, it's all you have to do is just say, well, that's, yeah, well, that's the hat I wear now. That's why I picked green. It, right? Well, green's like, in the rear view mirror. Orange <laughs> is where it's at. And you got to be super, like, uh, super intense and, and so fake. And I, oh, yeah, I can't handle that. Whatever. I'll, I'll find my, I'll find my lane. Um, <laughs> you're, I remember I, we were doing something out in Lake Tahoe a couple years ago when you, me and you were doing like a little sit down and we were talking about Michael Jackson and you just broke into song. You were singing, man, because I told you, man in the mirror. I was saying how that was my favorite. And you start singing it, and you want to have a little duet. And I was like, I just can't match your, match your passion. You're just unbelievable, right. man. And you're like, you're you're an all around. You I don't know. You just have a. You seem to. Uh, I'm a song. I'm a songbird. Well, yeah. Okay, so you going back. What was interesting to me is it. So you were. You said you were Adam Carolla's sidekick. Was that when he was on uh, terrestrial radio? Yeah, he was. Yeah, and it, when. When um, Howard Stern left to go do satellite radio, they cut the CBS radio, cut the 
continental U.S. up into three parts. The East Coast was hosted by David Lee Roth. Howard Stern was CBS Radio, so he leaves. David Lee Roth gets the East Coast. He's out of New York City. Some guy named Rover, who I don't know who that is. I think he was in Ohio or Michigan, maybe. <clears throat> he got a portion of the Midwest, and then the whole western side of the country was the Corolla show, and whichever, uh, whichever won out presumably would take over nationally at some point after a year, maybe two years. Um, and then, you know, Corolla lasted longer than the other two did. David Lee Roth, I think, was on the air for like two to four weeks before they were... But I mean, when you heard it, David Lee Roth, the guy from Van Halen, is going to be the host of a four-hour radio show? What? What's he going to say? For I can't imagine that guy, and that's pretty much the way the show sounded. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then uh, Corolla had the, the West Coast. Was but, it you just, know, so it. just you two on mic or anyone else? No, there was always a news girl as well. Is there, why does there always have to be a girl on those terrestrial shows? It's a funny thing. People always say, and not only that, generally speaking, they aspire to get a foxy lady in there, too. On, ra on radio? Yeah. I, I, and think about Howard Stern, what he always used to do. They, he always would do stuff with women that you would think, well, how, what do I care about your porn stars? I can't see them when you're rolling them through here. But there is something about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the imagination that I think most people envision if the voice is lovely, then so too must she be. That usually doesn't doesn't work out that way, Damashek. You know that. I don't know. I've only talked to like three or four girls in my life. I don't know. <laughs> well, they don't like me very much. Isn't it weird when you see radio guys like when you grew up listening to like the, a certain radio station, like Z ninety three? That was the radio station I grew up listening to. I still haven't seen those guys. They're they're off the air. But like when you you know when you see like a radio guy after you've heard him on the air for fifteen years or something, you're like, this is what you look like, and you're always like, it's just weird. It's like you never know what you always have this weird vision of what they are, and it never is what they sound like. I feel whenever I, it's I agree. Well, I grew up listening in Pittsburgh to Myron Cope on sports. Myron Cope, the greatest compliment I have ever gotten is from a few of the Steelers, is that they say, that they say like, man, you sound a lot like Myron Cope used to sound, which is, the, <laughs> which is supposed to be an insult, but I'm flattered by it. And the one that is insulting is when people come up to me and try to, try to compliment me, and they say, wow, I, you're a lot younger than I figure you'd be. I, uh, the, listening to your voice, I imagined a, an old fat guy. <laughs> you know? but that's, they thought you were what, Francesa? Like, <laughs> I guess that's what they thought I would look who like. Who is amazing, by the way. He falls asleep on air and won't admit it. They call him out. and he, I love when they call – oh, gosh. I don't listen to a show live or anything. I, I see clips on different serious shows I listen to, and they play clips of when people – like callers come in, call in and mess with them, and he just – he's the best, man. He's so fun. I hope that we both can reach a place in our life where we can start falling asleep at our job and not lose it. On camera – yeah, and and not even admit to it, and try to say he wasn't sleeping, but whatever. Uh, I want to talk about the the Corolla thing. So, how long were you on the air with him? Uh, one year, and then they fired me in favor of because the CBS executive really had wanted all along. He wanted Danny Bonaducci instead of Corolla, um, mm -hmm. and so he fired me and brought in Danny Bonaducci. Which, in hindsight, really at the time. It was a humiliation, but sincerely, in retrospect, how many human beings ever can claim that they were fired in favor of Danny Bonaducci? You know, that's a, in a way, that's a real feather in your Probably cap. just you. I Maybe, yeah. No, you know what? We think Bonaducci will be better at anything than you. In a <laughs> so, way that... Wait, wait, so was Bonaducci Corolla's sidekick on the air? For like a year, I think he was. How did yeah. that work? I can't see Corolla and Bonaducci like. Well, like you're not them. watching the Super Bowl after after the Packers lost. I didn't. Well, I wasn't sitting around yeah, listening yeah. to that show. To so were you all like? How did you honestly? Were you like? What year was that when you got fired? Uh that was. Uh, well, that was the year I was on the air was 2006. So it was like right around Christmas oh, time that so they not, booted. Not too long ago. Like, were you? Uh, was that like devastating to you? Yes, it was time? devastating. I just quit the Kimmel show. To go and do uh, to go and do the Corolla show. So and you were writing. You were writing for Jimmy Kimmel. Is that right? Yes. So what were you writing? Like his monologue. I would go. Uh, I would. Yeah, I'd hang around his office with him in the uh, three or so hours before the show. The the day would go with with uh, the Kimmel show. He used to have. He don't, they don't do this anymore over there. But 
they have a long table and you would sit down around lunchtime and there'd be a big feast of takeout food of whatever kind. And oh, that was a that was one time because so his assistant would order the food every day. And then we decided, you know what? The, she's not doing a good enough job of ordering the food. We need uh, a food czar. So we had an election and I won against another writer. Maybe there were some uh, some election day hijinks that went on behind the scenes that swung the election in my favor, but that's water under the bridge. You know, maybe there was some gamesmanship. But so then we got to, so then I got to order the food or decide what place we would order the food from, which was a great honor. It was a, it was it was it was a heavy crown to wear, but ultimately worth it. Anyway, you sit around with all your food and whatever the subject is. Hey, it's Octo Mom. You know, Octo Mom had another eighteen babies or whatever. So let's. We need jokes about that, and then you go around the table, and everybody pitches their ideas. You know that uh, that morning, so it's eleven thirty ish in the uh, you know a.m. And oh, how about if we did this? What if we videotaped this? Guillermo, the security guard, with uh, you know, so everybody pitches. Kimmel sits on his laptop, listens the whole time, writes down what he likes. Then you go, and, and then he would send that stuff to me, and then uh, then I would write the uh, the monologue around that, and everybody would write jokes and. Uh, pull it all together, and then Kimmel and I in his office in the run-up to the show, the three hours or so before the show, I would keep sending him little pieces, you know, little chunks of the script, and he would punch them up and punch them up and punch them up to what he wanted them to be, and then he would uh, go do the show. And so were you, were you considered the head writer for that show then? Yes. No. I, say, I, I want to say that just because it sounds cool, but no, I was not considered the head, head writer. writer for Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah, let's say that. Why head not? writer. If it was just you, if it's you and Jimmy in the room right before the show, and yeah, so what? Uh, and then, so whenever the is that just for the monologue, or do you guys write jokes that he uses throughout, like in his interviews and stuff? Uh, he, you know, if you if you watch him, he's definitely the best interviewer on of, of all the late night guys. Whatever your comedic tastes are, you can debate that, but. Um, you know, even Letterman at this point, you know, Letterman basically says like, so how was your winter? You know, that, I mean, that's how he starts interviews, you know, basically. And they can do on Kimmel's the best interviewer. But yeah, you would, you know, if it's, I don't know, George Clooney's on, there might be some things. So you can, I, you know, I would write some questions for him. Rarely would he get into them, but on occasion stuff would come up. One time, um, th- this was a fun sports one. Um well, two fun ones. One, Mike Ditka came on once, and he grew up in the same neighborhood as my mother in Steeltown, Aliquippa, PA. Tony Dorsich from the area, Darrell Revis, and so on. Ditka was on, though. And uh, so I told Kimmel to bring this up on the air, and he did. He asked Ditka, or he told Ditka that Mo Damashek, who is my, who, who is my mother, wasn't allowed to play with him growing up because uh, he and his brother used to pull down girls' underpants. And he didn't deny it, did you? To his credit, he said, that sounds like me. I probably is true. <laughs> um, but better was Wayne Gretzky came up. And you can tell, if nothing else, I am a defender of uh, my, my Pittsburgh sports teams. Lemieux, Mario Lemieux, of course, is the better NHL player. If you really watch the two, you would know this. But most people, they look at numbers, they get caught up with it, whatever. Gretzky's better. So I tell Kimmel, who, who fancied, fancies himself a hockey guy but you know he's an L. He, oh Gretzky's better you're crazy you're just trying to tout Lemieux and I said listen Kimmel this is fact Lemieux is the superior player and I want you to tell Gretzky as much Lemieux always gracious about Gretzky when asked it, you know NHL it's the equivalent of Babe Ruth and Willie Mays playing simultaneously as Gretzky and, and Lemieux being in the league at the same time Whenever Gretzky was asked, or whenever Lemieux was asked about Gretzky, oh, what an honor to even put in the same sentence. He's such a great player. You know, he's a legend. Gretzky, when asked about Lemieux, Mario's a good player. Never would compliment him. Always backhanded, and I never cared for it. So I said, Kimmel, now's the chance. I want you to bring this up to Gretzky. Ask him who he thinks is the best of all time. So sure enough, he does it live on on, uh, the show. And uh, Gretzky says, oh, there's so many good ones. It's hard for me to answer. Bobby Orr is great. Gordy Howe was my favorite. Kimmel says, you didn't say Mario Lemieux. And one of our writers, Damashek, says that uh, Lemieux's the best of all time. Gretzky says, oh, yeah, Mario's great, too. Mario's great, too. So that's the end of the that, – they move on to whatever not, nonsense they had to get to that night. Gretzky comes into the green room afterwards. 
I wanted to have a word with him about this interview. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> now, do you remember Gretzky always had? You remember, you know, you know goons, you know, in hockey, how yeah, the, the guys that the protect, best players those, yeah, protect, protect the, the pretty boys. So he had one called Dave Semenko. The guy's name was Semenko. And uh, so I go up to Gretzky, and instead tonight he has a PR girl with him. And I say, hey, Wayne, how come, uh, how come you didn't mention Mario when, uh, when Kim will ask you about him? And he said, uh, and he said oh, we talked about him. I said he was great. I said, yeah, but Kim will brought him up to you. And I, I, I was angry. I was agitated with him. And his PR girl senses this, and she starts grabbing at his elbow. And she says, come on, Wayne, let's go, let's go. They're leaving for the night. They're, they're going home now. And as they turn, and, but Gretzky is, is giving me the cross eye. He's giving me the stink eye. Like, what, 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 what the hell's going on here? And she says, let's go. This, uh, this is done. And he turns and walks away. And they get about 20 feet away from me. And I say, hey, Wayno, Semenko's not here to defend you tonight. And he turns around like he's going to come back at me and fight me. Now, I'm thinking to myself, one, what are the two, what, what, which way could this go? One, Gretzky whips me. So what? So he beats me up right there. I did it defending the honor of Lemieux. No shame for me. <laughs> True. But when you look at Wayne Gretzky, there's a decent chance I might take him out. What if I beat up the so-called greatest hockey player of all time? They'd build statues of me around Pittsburgh, PA for that. <laughs> but instead, the executive producer of the Kimmel Show saw this going down. He came in, and he, and he armbarred me and pulled me away. And he said, what the F are you doing, man? You can't get in fights with our guests like that. <laughs> Wayne escaped that night, but <laughs> that's the kidding. show. That's the show. My loyalty, Hawk. That's my. That's that's where my heart's at. That's true loyalty. You're right. I um, I respect the move in one point, and then, in the same time, think you're crazy. And I understand. I would have definitely understood if Wayne would have fought you. Well, you know what? That would have been. That would have been his funeral. So was that where <laughs> it would have been his funeral? He been, never fought in the NHL. I would just pull the sweater over his head. That would have been it. Yeah, you, yeah, I know. I believe me. I know. I know you would have. You would have. You would have put up a good fight. I would imagine Wayne. Wayne's PR girl would have jumped in and probably kicked you a few times and got you <laughs> down, and then he would have got you and, and finished you off. Um, <laughs> so that's worth. So to, to confront a guy like Wayne Gretzky for not pumping up your boy Lemieux. That's was that worth losing your job with with Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> Amazingly, I didn't get fired for that. That's unbelievable that you didn't. I mean, it's awesome. I, I, I I'm glad they didn't. But so when you went from what Corolla? So then you're at Jimmy. Oh, you went from Kimmel to Corolla, right? Yes, I I met uh, uh, my pal Sal. Introduced me. I was working with Sal on a uh, Is cousin a sport- Sal, the little, the little dude. Cousin Sal, yes, yes. He's another good football guy. If you ever want to talk football really? with uh, somebody, especially as a gambler. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. I yeah. Well, I mean, oh, yeah. I, I can tell you. Believe me. You can, you you can do that. say whatever they want. Um, yeah, he's a great, he's a super fun guy. But anyway, he was always good to me. And he said, hey, come over, watch football one day at my place. And I go over to his house. And uh, it turns out he's living in Kimmel's basement, basically. And uh, this is right when I'm just after I'd moved out here. I'd met Sal, worked with him on a sports trivia show. And all of a sudden, uh, it's me. Sal, another guy, and Jimmy Kimmel's hanging out. I'm like, what does Jimmy Kimmel's doing here? And then Adam Carolla showed up. So now it's the two man show guys and a couple other schnooks and me sitting there. It was crazy. And um, then at the end of the day, Kimmel said, like, hey, you know, we're hiring over at the man show. You know, you should uh, submit uh, something over there. And so I did, and he liked uh, one bit that I wrote. It's, oh, you know what? I, uh, that's how sad and uh, narcissistic I am. I still have the script to it. It was called Porta Juggy. Uh, it was a he, he liked this script called Porta Juggy. Remember the Juggy girls, the girls who jumped on trampolines? Yeah, yeah that's the, only, yeah, that's what everyone remember. Like that's their marquee thing from that show. Yeah. Uh, well, I wrote a bit about for the man on the go, Porta Juggy, and it was a uh, it was a midget who could you know, and she was a but she was a por- a, a Juggy girl who could do that, and he thought that was funny, so he hired me off of that. So, and then regretted it. So when you say you submitting something, like I don't understand that whole Hollywood, Hollywood world. You say when they say, like say Jimmy Kimmel says you should submit something. What is that? You write a script, they, for what, just most, like a little like five minute bit that they would show in the oh, air. No, no, they they do like it, that was. I remember writing that. They send you all these things. We need twenty jokes, topical jokes, and we want we need to see a scripted bit that you do, and we need. 
concepts for desk pieces. You know how they do, uh, you know, know, desk pieces are obviously pretty self-explanatory. You know, uh, Jay Leno doing funny headlines. You know, here, look at this funny headline, everybody. You know, that was my Jay Leno. That was a very good Jay Leno from, what is he from, West Virginia? (laughs) Look at my Jay Leno. I don't know whose voice that is. But anyway... (laughs) Um, yeah, that's, so you, that's, that's your real you, voice. That's not when you're not using your radio that's voice. It. That's it. Um, but, uh, so yeah, you would, so yeah, you submit, that's how, that's how you get those gigs. And, and, uh, that was weird too. Cause then I got the interview at the man show and, um, I, I thought it would be just Kimmel and the executive producer. But then of course, Adam Carolla was there and this, this guy who was kind of desiccated looking, you know, wrinkly and, Looked like he'd lost a lot of weight kind of guy, and he looked vaguely familiar. But I remember going in, executive producer, hello, Jimmy, hello, Adam. And, uh, and, and, and they said, and you know Bob, right? And, and I said, and, you know, it's rude if you don't say, if somebody gives you a question like, you know him, right? You don't say, no, I don't, I don't know who that is. <laughs> say, well, yeah, of course, I, of course I know who that is. And then I was fixated on him for the next five minutes. Who is that guy? I can't place him. And then I placed it, Bobcat Goldthwait. Who I had no idea was a director at the time. I thought, why did they have the guy from Police Academy in here? Is it to see how people react to him being in the room? To see if they make something fun out of it? I didn't know. I, I was so freaked out. It was the worst. It was one of the five worst things I've ever been involved in. That interview was a misery. And, uh, and uh, still uh, somehow uh, snuck in the back door and got the gig. You but, got the uh, gig. As a, so as a writer, that's what's weird. Like, no one knows about you, I feel like. So what was your original goal coming out to Hollywood? Did you want to write for comedy shows? Like, how did you – like, you're, you're full go into all this sports stuff now, and it seems like your whole background is, is like, writing for – writing sketches, and I don't know what – I don't know if you ever acted or did improv or whatever. Have you ever got on stage or in front of the camera yourself? No. I, I moved out here to do choreography because I love dance and I love to share that passion with, uh, with other humans. No, I, uh, <laughs> you had I, um, I, I was going with it. I, I, I wasn't going to question <laughs> yeah, that, it. You didn't know about, you, you didn't know about my great dancing ability. <laughs> You're such a good uh, actor. I was going to go, I was going with, with you. I, uh, no, I just, I was doing sales in Chicago and, and didn't like it and knew I was going nowhere doing it and, um, was dating a girl who had moved to LA and, and so I would go out and visit her periodically, like once every month or six weeks or whatever. And it was good enough. And she just, she said, why don't you move out here? Why do you do, try comedy writing? And I said, I have no degree in comedy writing. What, what background do I have to do that? And she said, what, what degree, what, what background does anybody have for that? What if it's not a degree in, in uh, comedy that you get from college, people just come out here and they try to do it. Um, so I did, and uh, like I said, I got on that sports trivia show and met Sal, and you know, then he introduced me to the to to Kimmel and uh, to to those guys, and and went from there. So I was doing, so yeah, so I came out here to be uh, a comedy writer to try to be one, and 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 really got lucky, and it's been a series of of good luck, really more than anything. It's a, it's a shame people, you know, young guys will get into young people get in touch with me. Hey, what tips do you have? I mean, really, the biggest tip is get lucky. I mean, that's a real. I, uh, that, that's my that's all i can attribute it to was a ser- you know the generosity of uh of jimmy kimmel and uh, a few others helping me along the way but yeah i did man show then i did crank yankers um then i wrote on do you remember that gary Busey pseudo reality show where he helped the one guy try to teach him life lessons that was great what, i did that what, for about uh, six months what network was it on Comedy Central, and it would have been like 2000. Uh, it would have been 2003 ish, 2002. I don't think I. I don't think I've seen it. I've, I'm usually up. It was there. crazy. It should have been awesome. It should have been. So a you great wrote show. for that? Yeah, we, it, like it. You know how curb your enthusiasm. They outline the show so they know yeah. where it's going, but they don't script specific lines. Really, it was that sort of show. But Busey was so insane. <laughs> that he was incapable of understanding even what you wanted out of a scene. Like, Gary, here's what you need to do to move this episode along. You have to teach the guy that you want to take him to the train tracks because that'll teach him about grit and determination. Like, all right, all right. Now, Dave, what do I have to do in this scene? Gary, I I just told you, (laughs) what you have to do is that. Like, all right, now explain this scene to me. Like that, I mean, but it was was that. I'm I'm not exaggerating. 
that that's how daft he was. He had no ability to retain anything. And in fact, the one time he always had with him, everywhere he went, he had one of those, like you see in espionage pictures, uh, one of those metal attache cases with him, except he didn't have the... the, uh, the, um, the uh, He wasn't handcuffed to it? Handcuffed to it. But otherwise, that's what it was. And for literally months, we wondered, what is inside that thing? What, is, what could be it? What nefarious kind of stuff does this ne'er-do-well have in there? And one night in his trailer, he left it ajar, and I couldn't, I, I couldn't help myself. So I looked in there, and it was about 30 of those travel size bags of Fritos and Doritos. That's he it. just raided the, he dra- he raided the craft services I don't know how many times. And, and got dozens of these bags of those little crowd and, and they were but like but you know like when they open those in the movies they always have the perfectly lined up bills in there that's what it was except it was in snack chips it that's, was great I don't I love it I mean he's, he so he, he so he's not putting on an act that's that's him right what no well he puts on one act where he thinks like this is the character I play but he's a different kind of loco <laughs> altogether he is out to lunch the executive producer. You did this twice, legitimately did this twice. We were on location, shooting on set, and Busey would act up. He would always act up, but so, sometimes he would get so out of bounds. This happened two times in the six months I worked there. The executive producer would cancel the show, theoretically, for Busey's uh, sake. He'd say, I'm sorry, the show is canceled. We are no longer doing the show. I'm sorry, Gary is incorrigible. Everyone, go home, please. I'm sorry. The show is hereby canceled, and we would have to go home for this 50-year-old man or whatever Gary Busey was because he was misbehaving. We would have to pretend like, I'm sorry, hey, it was great working with you, Gary, and we would go home, and then overnight, Gary would leave a message for the executive producer. (laughs) Jim, it's Gary. I'm sorry for my behavior. I would like another chance, and then the show would be back on. It was ridiculous. You guys would actually like shut down for the day and go home? We'd go home. You'd go home. That would be the end of the show because it was canceled. And then, of course, you would show up the next day because Gary would apologize. Oh, man. I love that dude. He was great in uh, what, Point Break. That He's so good in Point Break. And then, Point Break. But he seemed like he really put – he really – well, I'm sure it was – if you talk to guys that were on set, talk to Keanu. Keanu's got some good stories about him, I bet. But he, everybody, uh, he says everybody's his brother. Keanu's a brother. Oh Kevin's a brother. We saw, we, we saw once uh, – who are the guys in, uh, in the Eagles? Not Glenn Fry, the other guy. Don Henley. Yeah. We saw Don Henley. We're shooting randomly on the streets of Malibu, and we happened to see Don H- Henley from a distance – and we say, oh, look at that, Don Henley. And Gary announces, Don's a brother. So we say, oh, let's get him in the, this shot. It'll be fun to bring him over there. So we go over and say, hey, Don, we're shooting with Gary Busey over there. He says, keep that mother effer away from me. <laughs> really? <laughs> keep him away from me. But he, anyway. was, uh, he was great on Celebrity Apprentice. <laughs> they, uh, did you watch, do you happen to see the, the season when uh, Busey was on there? No, I can't. It's another one. I don't want to watch it. I've already been through it. I yeah. don't need any more Busey after having been around them for six months. See, but then after that, I got onto Kimmel, and that was that. Kimmel, boom, NFL Network. Now you're you're everything. What? Yeah, you, know, you already basically said what your dream job was. But I don't know why that <clears throat> that whole writing world and what you've done. Like I can't even begin to think like how. Uh, any normal person would start to even write like a script. Like it's only, yeah, you just send something in or whatever. Like how, so say you sit down to write a script. How do you even start? Like you literally write the name Jimmy and then you start his line and then you put in Sal, like, and you just spell it out. And then you even got to write, I mean, like type up, I don't, I don't even know how that process even begins. It's so foreign to, to me. How, how did, did you just honestly just start it? Like, Oh, I just, I just winged it at first and you were good at it. No, I, I, well, I, I mean, I think I'm probably better at it than, than the average human being, but I definitely, that is not my, my greatest strength, that's for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm fine at, uh, at um, joke writing, but I'm, I'm certainly not. I mean, the guys at, uh, that I worked with at Kimmel are, are, you know, really, I mean, blow, you know, intimidatingly funny on the page. You know, they're not, uh, not it is funny. A lot of the Simpsons writers, some of the some of the most uh, demonstratively demonstratively funny people I've ever been around uh, are are those Kimmel writers or guys who have written at the Kimmel show. Um, but 
uh, by comparison, like The Simpsons. The Simpsons is the funniest show of all time in my book. And I've met some of those guys, and they are not. They're bookish, and they're quiet, and they're standoffish. And it's, it's weird. They just they know, how to, they know how to turn a phrase. They know how to make a, put a story together. I, you know, I, I, I believe, honestly, I'm not the best person to ask about something like that because there are people who are, are brilliant at putting it. So I would, I would uh, not do the, do the process justice. But, yeah, the people who write movies or, or half hours or who write sitcoms and stuff, yeah, they, you know, they, they create, I, as far as, uh, uh, you know, I think the majority of people come up with what the basic story is and they just keep expanding the outline. They keep building out the outline. So, so he'll get into trouble, and then he'll get into more trouble. But by the end of it, he'll get his way out of trouble. Now, all right. So what? What you know? Along the way, now let's start adding those things in, and they build it out. What I was doing, a late night show is different than that. That's just riffing off of what's topical in the news for the most part. You know, like, hey, I'm Jimmy Key. I've got, but li- you do actually write that stuff. Like, hi, I'm your host, Jimmy Kimmel. You know, like that. You 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 do script that kind of stuff, and um. You know, but Kimmel's one of those guys who is inherently funny, so he, you know, he can improvise and go off the script and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, you basically string all that stuff out. Well, him and him and Jimmy Fallon, I think, have changed the the late night game forever. They those guys, when you watch them now, and then you go and you watch like Letterman. I mean, he, Letterman's an absolute dinosaur now compared to those yeah. dudes. Like they, the stuff they do, and Jimmy Fallon's just stepped it up an absolute. I mean, I don't. I, what, is Colbert taking over for Letterman? Is that right? Yeah. Like the stuff that Fallon does, <clears throat> like you said, Kim will definitely is probably the best sit-down interview guy there is. Um, but Fallon, the stuff that Jimmy Fallon does is like, like he he'll play, he'll sing and play guitar with like U two. Uh, I watched him with Billy Joel, and he, and then he does all these crazy comedy sketches, and then he like he just changed it so much. If you if you compare him to like a Letterman to uh, Jay Leno at least as a stand-up, so he still has like bits and does all kind of stuff. And I guess Letterman was a stand-up as well. But it's like, um, it's like the new generation taking over of late night. And it's I, funny. It's you're, crazy. you're too young. You're younger than I am. You probably don't even remember Johnny Carson on the air. I mean, I, I, did, I didn't know him on the air, but I've watched that documentary on him. Have you ever seen it? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I did see it. It's great, man. It. Scary watching him. Like He was so like alcoholism throughout his life and he just wanted to make his mom happy and proud the whole time and he's like well established with the tonight show and he his mom he'd come backstage after a show and his mom would like tell him it wasn't good and it would like crush his whole dreams like it was it was sad actually that's what my mom does to me well that's yeah i'm sure no, after she's this, the opposite after this podcast uh, she'll probably send me an email killing oh me no i guarantee you my mother and father are sitting listening to this right now well not right now they're watching it all the way through they they've never i i wrote Oh, what I what I skipped though, before I did the Man Show, so I went from that sports trivia show, and before the Man Show, I wrote for BattleBots for a few months. BattleBots, really? Remember the robot show, the fights? They would sit. My mother would sit and watch just so that at the end of the show, when the credits rolled by and my name showed up, she would cheer. That's that. That's uh, that's the kind of uh, demented family I come I come from. That's a good thing, though. Is it um? Are your parents, do they, have they ever, um, no matter what you have done, are they always like super proud regardless, even if they don't understand the show you're doing? Like Crank Yankers, were they, was your mom super proud of you for Crank Yankers, which is very funny. Yeah. No, they they, 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 they always have been. But it, in fact, it's bad because, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of the comedians, they are like, like Johnny Carson. They're looking for, you know, they, they have parental issues or, you know, they're looking for validation from the world or they have self-esteem issues i do too but mine come from the opposite it's not that i had delinquent parents my parents were so loving and so encouraging about what i could do you can do whatever you want and but that when i went out into the world you know to school every day and beyond I, i i realized hey why is everybody not this supportive everybody everybody else is shooting me down i don't care for this and it created a complicated psyche for me that the rest of the world has not realized what Mo Damashek has learned, and now I must uh, I must prove them wrong. So is that what you're fighting for? Is to get the validation that your parents have given you all along your whole life is from from everyone else around you and all your peers? Well, if Mike Tomlin would call me and give me his validation, that would be enough at this point. 
who's uh, who's the, who's the Penguins head coach right now? Uh, what is his name? Johnston. Mike Johnston. Is it okay? So any, I don't know why I even asked you that. I figured any, if anyone, if if a guy running for Pittsburgh City Council called you and, and told you you did a good job, I think you'd be pretty happy. I'd be pleased with that. Yeah, yeah. That, I just don't know what's going to be this autumn, Hawk. When when you know you pay a visit to Heinz Field, I oh, don't know. This fall I, I don't is know. that what you Pittsburghians? Pittsburghian. I'm sure. Do you like me? Degrade? No, is we it, call we call them Pittsburghers. They're Pittsburghers. Is it really? Yeah, I knew it I wasn't. Not, I knew it wasn't Pittsburghian. I was messing around, but I I never. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. It's Pittsburgher. You know what's weirder than that one? Huh. I just found this out. What do you think people from Utah are called? Utes. No, Utahns. Utahns. Really? Sounds like Scientology. Or the two, something. the two Utes. My cousin Danny. That's what I was thinking. Um, but uh, I don't remember what we were kibitzing about. Oh, you were asking about you. Well, you said this autumn when I visit Heinz Field oh, as yeah, a member well, of the Bengals. But I was just—I cut you off. I, I've never, I haven't heard anyone call it autumn since 1943. I call it fall when in my book. Right. Oh, well, you want to? You do yeah. you. I'll so do what me. happens in fall? You mean what's going to happen in Heinz Field this fall? Oh, I mean, what's what's to be? I mean, I, I I don't know that if what if what if they meet in the playoffs? I don't think uh, I, I you know I, I think I'll shut it down for a week. No hawk talk for a week at least. Yeah, it's gonna be a, it'll be a good problem to have, obviously for both of us. You 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 want your Steelers to, to do well. Your your boy Big Ben just got re-upped. Um, an Ohio kid, by the way. Um, That's right. And then uh, and you gave us Chaz No. We gave you our river. You gave us Big Ben and Chaz. No, how do how do people how how do all you Pittsburghers uh, feel about Big Ben? Are you guys all on, have you been on board with him since day one? He's won two rings for you. You should be. Well, it was impossible not to be early in his career when he you know he came out of the gate as a rookie was starting by week two or two, I know starting by week three took over for Tommy Maddox in week two and didn't lose a game. They 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 went all the way to the AFC title game, and then the, the Patriots beat them. But, um, yeah, so everybody everybody was – but then uh, and then the next year they win the Super Bowl, and then that summer is when he has the motorcycle accident. Remember when he planted his face in the windshield? Oh, yeah, man, he had to get plastic surgery, everything to get all – I mean, it was ridiculous. Lost a ton of weight. That was a yeah. – he got lucky, really. Yeah, that's right. Um but yeah, I think everybody, you know, everybody is on board with him for the most part. Yeah, I, I, I don't know anybody, you know, the, as a football guy, there as a football player, I don't know that there are many guys outside of number twelve uh, from Green Bay who who are better than Roethlisberger at this point. Ben's a stud, man. He, uh, I've had, I've watched him. My brother went to school with him at Miami of Ohio. Uh, my brother transferred to Ohio U. My brother was quarterback. Um, they came in the same class, and is that right? That's yeah, fantastic. yeah, they were roommates and everything. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, Ben's awesome, man. Every time I see him, we we talk, and he asks me about my oh, brother. He's a cool guy with you? Yeah. Oh yeah, he's been great. Um, always been, always been really cool. My my brother's cool with him, even though my brother left the school because Ben became Ben. You know, uh, but that's just that's how it goes. Ben was such a stud at Miami, and he still is. Obviously, he's still in Pittsburgh. But did you guys stick with him through the whole whatever? I don't even. With sexual assault and all that situation, that whole deal. Yeah, it was always you know you think about that in hindsight. Well, I mean, they're, they're, and then they're writing scathing Sports Illustrated, uh, you know, pieces about him and how he's known about town. And it wasn't a well kept secret that um, that you know that the, uh, among some of the sports media guys, his reputation. But you know, he's a. I, I you know better than me. It's easy for me to dismiss. It makes me seem cavalier. To, to say, ah, he's a kid, but you know, you look at the Jameis Winston thing and I, uh, the Jameis Winston story, and you know, six eight months ago, people were saying, who's gonna? Nobody's gonna touch this guy. Nobody's gonna touch this. Uh, who, who's gonna draft this guy? And I said, I bet you, just like I said a year ago, Jadavian Clowney will end up being the number one pick. Remember that all the all the people up oh, on Mount yeah. Pius, up on Mount Pius in October of whatever year that was in, in his last year, Clowney. People said. Well, he, he, he's sitting out these games. He, he has no heart for the game. And I said, look, he's making a business decision. You should admire yeah. this if you're a GM in the NFL, that this guy just watched Marcus Lattimore, his teammate, <laughs> ruin his knee and his career ultimately, sadly. He's probably saying, I, why am I going to take that same risk? Why do I have to play by this system? I'm going to rest up, and I'll be nice and fresh. 
And, and sure enough, he did go number one. This year, I've said over and over again, obviously, Jameis is going to go number one. I, 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 I don't mean to be glib about serious charges against, against these guys, but I also think, you know, guys, you know, people in college, people at that age do naughty stuff. Now, I mean, it doesn't mean you should commit felonies or anything like that, but, you know, I, uh, I do understand that people change their lives in early 20s. It's, I just can't, like I always say to you, like I say to, to all professional athletes, you guys do not understand what it's like just being regular in the world. I mean, you, you, you guys have lost touch. You, I, I really do think, and it's uh, you, as people have said about Tom Brady, the guys who know Tom Brady, Willie McGinnis and those guys say, the greatest thing about him is he is just seems like a regular guy. That's what I would say about you. For a guy who was a bit, I mean, listen, you were an All-American at Ohio State. I remember watching you in college. That had to be a trip on your brain to, to be get, you couldn't go on the place you're at college. Everywhere you walk, everybody knew who you were. Oh, it's A.J. Hawk. Look at him. Um, I'm sure that was crazy. And then you're the fifth overall pick. You lose touch with just, you know, but in the same way, I can't relate to what that must do to your head and what you think you can get away with in life. You must just think, I'll, I'll, they're, they're, I am above. Human beings, most teenagers don't recognize their mortality. That's what, you know, they, they're, nobody understands the long-term implications of bad decisions when you're 16 or 18. I can't imagine if I were considered the bee's knees and colleges were falling all over me to have me come there or pro teams were drafting me and willing to pay me a million dollars to do my stuff. I, I, I bet I would have been uh, I would have been quite a quite a fellow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I always have like a, I try to look at it from like a, I don't know. I always use Bieber as an example. <laughs> Everyone like hates on Bieber, and like I understand he seems like a little punk, but I'm like the dude's probably got like over a hundred million dollars and the most famous guy on the planet for a while, and yeah, he's doing stupid things, whatever, peanut buckets, throwing eggs at his neighbors. I like. He's like 18 years old, 17, whatever it was. We uh, none of us can ever even put ourselves well, in that situation. And, and as far as that goes, it's also as though they. I think w when people react to like Justin Bieber or Jameis Winston or whatever else, I think people sort of look at it as though that guy just emerged from a vacuum and just now is doing this bad stuff, driving fast down the street. It's like. Think about what his day was leading up to that moment. <laughs> Everywhere he goes, people are like, Justin Bieber! Every girl would lay down with him. You know, it's the same thing, I'm sure, for, uh, for you guys. You know, every woman throws herself at you. Everybody pats you on the back. It's not like Justin Bieber in his day-to-day -day life. People are telling him, like, hey, shape up, kid. You need to stop <laughs> acting this way. All he ever hears is like, oh, you're awesome. I love you. Give me a hug. Sign my boob. You know, like, what, 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 what? <laughs> so then he goes out into into the regular world and and uh, he's continues to behave in that manner and then pe and, and, well whoa this isn't cool for me to act this way all the time he's in, you know of course he's emboldened by all that stuff yeah he is we're getting I mean, heavy here hawk yeah it's good I'm gonna I'm gonna start to wrap it up here the only thing I want uh, how do you feel um, a couple more for you because you just you have a million we've been going here for a long time man I'm sorry to I know I'm keeping you forever. But I got I got all kind of you're you got so many layers to you, Damashek. You're like uh, you're Heavy. like um uh, damn, what can't think of his name? The the great actor. I'll come up with it. I don't know. You know the, guy, was a, the guy that I'm gets a lot, character um from the I'm completely blank. Marlon Brando and Streetcar Named Desire. <laughs> I not, captured I'm not his that essence. Old. I'm I feel not that like. old. Uh, um um who cares? It's stupid for me to even try to. Denzel see Washington. Yes, cool. Denzel. That's it. No, um, Michael Clark Duncan. Rest his soul. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> you remind me of him. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, no, like, so how do you, what are your thoughts on, I always want to know how people feel about, so the guy, um, Bill Simmons, I don't know if you know him personally. I've never, I've never spoken to the guy, but he had a, uh, whatever on his podcast. You remember it was last year during the season, maybe he had a podcast, which, People have podcasts so they can be honest and they can give their true opinions, which is why people love them. That's why I listen to all these <clears throat> these comedians on podcasts because they they'll say stuff that I couldn't I can't imagine ever putting out there publicly. Just crazy personal things, and they don't care. And I it at it's it's nuts, but it's I respect the fact that these people are that open. And Bill Simmons got on and he just said 
um, I don't know if you re remember when he just he's like, said Goodell was a liar. They're saying Goodell didn't know, a, didn't hadn't seen the tape maybe, or didn't like of uh, when Ray Rice punched his wife in the face, and then she hit, I remember hit her it head. All, and, sure. Yeah, and so Bill Simmons went on this thing on his podcast and just went on a little like five minute rant saying he's lying. He's an absolute liar. Like if he if he claims he didn't see this and he had, he didn't know about this tape, whatever. And then ESPN. Suspended for two weeks, I think. Because he dared them. He said that yeah. was part of it. Was that, that, that was, was that, what did, they hung there? Okay, so did, like the big the execs feel like he was like thought he was above what the brand or something. Well, he all yeah. I I, I I've known Simmons because yeah, he worked at uh, he moved out to L.A. from Boston uh, for the Kimmel Show, and then he worked there for uh, okay. I think the first three years, two three years or thereabouts, and then he went back full time. ESPN. Um, well, and uh, I don't want to. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I want to make sure I'm so terrible and bounce everywhere that I, I the the problem I have with what his situation was. I don't. I feel like networks are so scared of their sponsors. They're so, and I'm not saying this is what ESPN is. But I just I feel like in general this happens all the time that they they don't stand by their guys ever, even if they agree with him. Like they can't, I know Goodell and ESPN have to be tight. You can't mess up. You can't make the, uh, the commissioner upset with you, but it's like, they never, you, you want to call yourself, Oh, this is the guys network. This is on every bar and restaurant. And this is what every guy is where we're, we're, this is for guys. And obviously they want girls to watch too, but, and then I'll, you, you like suspend your guys when you feel like they say something that was a little out of line. And it's not like he didn't throw like a racial slur out. He wasn't making fun of any groups. He was just saying that he, in his opinion, Goodell was a liar. And yeah, he might have dared him a little bit and was a little like, uh, you know, he put himself out there. And, and but why, why don't these networks stand by their guys? Like, and is that something that's in your head that you're worried about ever? the network coming back on you and I mean, best case scenario is getting suspended. Worst case, obviously you just get fired now. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I certainly don't have the juice that Bill Simmons has it. You know, he, he'd be, I think ESPN, I, I can't imagine that they would ever fire Bill Simmons. He's really, um, to, to make the point that we were talking about more than an hour ago, really digital is where it's at. He does. Simmons does more and more TV stuff, but, um, you know, he, the digital empire he's built. Is that Grantland? He Did he start and Grantland? And, yeah, and at Grantland. Now he's really more significant, I would, I would say, than Chris Berman or anyone else. There's no one who is more valuable to ESPN at this point than Simmons. So, I mean, honestly, I, I, I have talked with him about it once or twice. And my, opinion, my, my sense has always been that it was about him challenging ESPN. Go ahead and suspend me. You're not going to suspend me for this. I think... I always took it that way, but it could be obscuring the reality, which is you can't go at commissioners. I know Bud Selig got um, Scott Van Pelt suspended a couple of years back, or maybe five, six. What did he do? I don't know about that. He was making fun, making old jokes, making like old timer kind of jokes, I believe, and uh, Selig didn't like it, and uh, Scott Van Pelt was shelved for a year or two, something like that. Ooh. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, to me though. Yeah, I, I'm not worried. If I worried, I'm going to do that. No, because I don't. I, I I feel like my default setting is to is to just talk hooey and applesauce. So I don't. I'm not. I'm not, something. I'm not going to. Uh, you know, a four letter word's not going to slip out of my mouth suddenly. I'm not going to. Oh, did I just say that on on camera? I can't believe it. Um, I'm not worried about that happening to me. However, I do see. Sometimes when you try to play ball, when you try to when you try to play ball like that at a fast speed and you're shooting from the hip, certain guys aren't ready to play at that speed, but then they try to, and they're the ones who get in trouble. <laughs> they're the ones who slip and say, oh, wait, well, I was just trying to be. In fact, Chris Culliver, you remember at the Super Bowl with Artie Lang a few years ago? Yep. I always felt bad for him because I think that's a young guy trying to play ball with this guy who's clearly trying to make trouble in a funny way. Yeah, Artie Artie, Lang. It's Artie Lang, I mean... <laughs> He's hysterical, uh, but he's, must not. He obviously probably didn't know Artie, but yeah, he's trying to make trouble, and so Chris Culliver, just to try and relate to the guy who he's talking to one on one, says says things, and his life has changed forever. What, really, did he say know? something like, "I don't want a gay teammate" or something like something that? Something to that effect. Yeah, yeah and Artie like was that. doing a straight just, and Artie's a comedian. Comedians can get away with more than anybody right. because they're basically self employed too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, you know, I mean, to me, Simmons is great because Simmons says what he thinks. 
what he really thinks, too. He doesn't <laughs> make up stuff to be controversial. He says what his opinion is. And to me, I'm, I'm incented to believe this. But I feel like I, the guys I want to talk to, whether it's you or Ike Taylor or Michael Robinson, I don't care what your level is or LaDainian Tomlinson. I don't care if you're Hall of Fame bound or, you know, not on a team or never played football. I care. And I, I ultimately think that that's what the audience thinks. Witness Howard Cosell, not to just uh, lean on that example, but that is the best example. He's not a football player or anything else. He was just a compelling figure. I think, I, you know, and then Dan Marino proves the other side of that. Dan Marino, all, you know, all-time great, exciting to watch and everything, but he was snoozy on TV, and so he's not on TV anymore. And I think four minutes in, what, how interesting you are, is far more important to the audience than like, well, did he play the game? And how many Super Bowls did he win? I don't think people care about that as much as executives think people care about that. Yeah, I think it gets it obviously gets people in the door, but then it's up to them yeah. to keep the job. You, I mean, you know, like a guy like Peyton Manning, every network's going to be offering him big time contracts, and if you, I don't know if he wants to do TV or not, and then boom, it's up to Peyton to, you know, I don't know how long that leash is, but I know guys have tried it. There's been, I think Montana was on TV for a year after he got out, and he's another Emmett Smith, Jerry Rice, all those guys are yeah, Emmett's all fame, time Emmett's great. Fam- YouTube famous from his time on TV. <laughs> Inventing words yeah. and stuff. Yeah. I played golf with Emmett in Tahoe. He was great, man. He's a good dude. But yeah, he... he's very nice. I've met him. Yeah, he is very nice. But <laughs> but some of his TV moments were, uh, uh, yeah, they'll live forever. I'm excited about that. <laughs> You're excited about that? Yeah, I don't know. I just had a the whole Simmons thing bugged me that I I, did, I guess when you, if you challenge the network, yeah, of course they're going to stand up and take a stand. But at this point, I I think ESPN needs Simmons more than Simmons needs ESPN. He could do Grantland. On his own, he doesn't have to have them carrying it. It's, that's the great thing about what's happening now. He doesn't. He doesn't need them. I'm sure he gets. Paid. Neither do you. Neither does anyone else. You can really build your own thing. It's really a matter of you know, without being boring. It's really about you know, selling it and how you know who are you bringing in sponsors and all that. That's snoozy stuff. And so most people probably decide ultimately ah, i don't want to well, i have to build a sales team and i do all that i don't want to do all that stuff ah, i'll just work for you and, and let you guys do that but yeah i mean a good example is the guy who we mentioned adam carolla after he left terrestrial radio he's built a podcast empire now and makes uh, seven figures doing uh, without any middleman and he works you know he works blue too you know he's scatological oh, yeah. he talk, you know he doesn't go two sentences without the referencing <laughs> masturbation, you know, and yet he makes millions of dollars doing that. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's promising times for, uh, for, yeah, but really the bottom line is either you, you know, I, I think the, you do have to shoot from the hip though. I think you have to be honest though. I don't know who cares what you have to say if it's going to be, you know, uh, quite frankly, in the national football league, we, you know, all that kind of jazz. Cause it's true. There's not really, the, it, it's not that complicated. When that's what's cool. You said you don't like when people say, "Oh, you're on a two-game losing streak. How are you going to turn that around?" Like, I understand the question and whatever, but there's real. Like, what can you say to that? Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. Who knows? We'll see. Let's just hope A Rod plays well. Like that's the be- Yeah, the best question. <laughs> the best of all questions is the post-game um, sideline. The, when the sideline reporter after the game gets out there. And after a big win, they say, how excited are you about this win? <laughs> like, on what, what do you mean? On a scale of 1 to 10? Or, like, what do you, what do you I, I, how, how do I, how, very, I don't, very, very, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a joke, man, some of it. And it's not even the reporter's fault, usually. It's the, the guy in their ear, probably, that has never, I don't know. Doesn't matter. You know what I want to do with you, Hawk, though? What? I really did want to do this at the Super Bowl if you had made this and won. I figured you'd be the one guy who would do this. Uh-oh. Right after the game, when the confetti's falling and everybody's hugging their their wives and their and the kids and doing these interviews, I thought it would be super funny if I caught you on the field right after in your in your moment of glory, and I just started complaining about my day to you. <laughs> I would have gone with it. I would have loved it. I would have gone with you, it. Man. Hey, did you get breakfast at your hotel? Because they put out at mine, they put out this continental breakfast. They called it that, but it was like a half stale bagel and uh, and some and some jelly. I mean, I thought it was garbage. But anyway, how are you doing today, AJ Hawk? Like, I thought that would be a funny bit to do. I would have gone with it. You could, yeah. Well, maybe 
Maybe next year, Damashek. Right. I know you're going to be upset if your Steelers don't get it, but they got enough rings, man. Yeah, but you have Andy Dalton. Let the Bengals you know, get him. You know, you know, come on, Andy Dalton ain't going to do it for you. Yes, he is, buddy. You look up oh, and down there. Look all over the roster, Damashek. Studs, right, every, studs everywhere testing. you look. I wanted to see how quickly you jumped in, uh, in, in on that. That's come the on. question you get. Can and uh, Get ready for that until kickoff. You know that's going to be the question you answer. Do you feel coming from Aaron Rodgers, coming away from arguably the best uh, quarterback of the generation, do you now look at Andy Dalton? Do you think he has what it takes to win a Super Bowl? Let's hear your answer to that because you're going to be answering that over and over again. Yes, he does. (laughs) That's good. Become that guy. Just give one answer. How else would you answer that? I think if you get a stupid question, you should give him a stupid response. Yeah. But well, there's a lot of, I've, I've asked stupid questions all the time. I've asked you a ton on here, so I can't. I feel for them too. I understand how the media, how it works. It's not a. It's a good thing, man. They're they're there to promote the game. But yeah, it's it's a weird world because you're trying to get tiny little sound bites here and there. Boom, boom. Like local news. That's one. That's gone. Who's after my parents died? No one's watching the local news ever again. Like weatherman. <laughs> I always. I always tell, how is there a weatherman? Now, like, how do you have a weather? Everyone's weatherman is their phone when you just look at it. We got a dude telling us in front of a green screen, which I have a green screen, uh, what the weather's going to be that tonight and the next day. And we're like, no, it's on your phone now. Like, so I think, do you think all that's going to just be obsolete? Like, local, I always say local news, the paper, like, is already going by the wayside. I mean, obviously, you can get it digitally now. That's what they're doing. But, like, do you think like, local news and local weather, is that just going to, be wiped off the earth, you know, in another 15 I, I years. I wonder, I, yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, it, it, it's it's uh, that older generation that still leans on that. Yeah, who do you know that's like, hey, oh, it's, is it, it, it's almost 11 o'clock, good. <laughs> please put on, uh, please put on NBC because I want, I, my, my, that's, you know, my, as you're right, my, gen, my parents' generation, they don't just watch the news. They have the anchors that they like best. <laughs> oh, no, no, we watch, we always watch CBS here. We like that, we <laughs> We like we like Patty on the uh, on eleven o'clock news. She's better. We like her. She's good. Um, but yeah, you're right that that's a weird thing that uh, that the weather. I mean, the weather obviously could take twenty seconds. Hey, today it was seventy. Why you need a retrospective look at the weather that just was like that's a that doesn't make that is completely useless. Hey, hey, wear your, wear your wear your gloves. Wear your mittens today, guys, and maybe your galoshes. We're gonna get some freezing rain. Like, no, we don't need that dude anymore. Yeah, and well, the the thing that's in L.A. that's crazy, and uh, you have no doubt heard about that, that that's the stereotype. It, I mean, it is weird when it's 70 to 75 <laughs> most days that the, the need for an expanded five-minute new uh, weather segment is really unnecessary to tell you, yep, it's going to keep, keep being sunny here <laughs> for the next uh, week. But um, they do, if it rains here, literally, if it rains here, it is, it's not just on the news, it is the top story. That is like rain. People here in Los Angeles trying to deal with the rain as they go through traffic. Then sound bites from people like, "Yeah, I, you know, I, I went probably 15 miles slower on the on the freeway because of, <laughs> of the rain. It was a little slick." I mean, they interview people about the rain, but that's pathetic. But that's the reputation out here. It's weird. I lived in Chicago and Pittsburgh. If it's cold outside in those places, that's the lead story there. Like, hey, bitter temperatures. And then they tell you what you're supposed to do about it. Make sure you wear a hat and glove outside. Like you said, <laughs> well, who, well, who's watching the news that didn't know that this was the, the solution to the cold if you're outside? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That when like, So I always, my, my in-laws, the, I see them a lot because they live right by us, and they're, they're awesome. And they'll, they'll tell me like something that happened. Like, oh, well, did you see on the, the news this morning? Did you see that a car went off the road on 75? I was like. No, I didn't see that. What do you, I, could, I read it on my phone. I read it on my phone two seconds after it happened. I didn't wait nine hours to hear it from the guy in the news at six at night. You know, like that's so old. It's so. It's just. It's like I look at like, like Letterman now, who I have a ton of respect for, but he's a dinosaur compared to these young guys coming up and just changing the whole world and how they do skits and they put everything online on YouTube. We can get it, boom. Like instead of trying to pull it off of of YouTube like they have in the past. And it's, I just always think about that. I'm like, I literally don't know one person other than like my parents or my in-laws. And I don't even know how many, how much like local news my parents watch, but they watch a little bit that watch like the 11 o'clock news. And then they wake up in the morning and turn the local news on. I just don't, and there's obviously many other examples of something like that, but I don't know anybody my age and I'm older. I'm, I'm thinking of these kids. I'm like, think of like the 20 year old kids now. They've never, they don't even know that exists. 
the, the local news or Kids, the typed up newspaper. I can't believe this, but it's true that, I mean, giant percentage of, you know, 18-year-olds, 15-year-olds literally do not watch broadcast TV at all. All they watch is Apple TV, and they watch stuff on their laptops and stuff. They really do. They, that, they don't even know about, like, remote control, regular old TV like we go through. That's not even a part of their thing. Like, what, wait, what do you mean you can't wait till Tuesday night at 9 o'clock to watch that show? <laughs> Why don't you just watch it whenever you want to? It's, on, it's online, available to you whenever you want to watch it. Yeah, it's a good. I think it's good. It's cool how things are moving, and I like it. I like things being on demand. Everything else, but the nothing dates someone more or ages them more quickly. I think than when someone that uh, like refuses to uh, accept how things are going, like in that direction, like things going towards the on demand online when you want it. And it's, well, there's always going to be space. There's always going to be. Are you kidding me? Terrestrial radio is the, the greatest thing ever. you got to build the audience and you're terrestrial. I'm like, no, I don't know anyone under the age of, I don't know anyone under the age of 40 that listens to terrestrial radio very much at all. I've never even, I haven't hit the FM button in my car in years, I don't think. So it's just one of those things that, uh, I don't know, some people are holding on. I'm I'm rambling. Well, it's, but it's the younger people. So, but see, with your matinee, looks and everything so you'll appeal to to the younger lady what there. does matinee looks mean well, that's what they say matinee idol good looks i don't know i've never heard of matinee I'm i was sure. just patronizing you because i'm the one with the matinee idol good looks um yeah. but uh, that's what they say that's what they used to call like the you know mid 20th century stars you know matinee idol looks you know the handsome devils Handsome. Hey, daniel day lewis said, was the actor i was thinking of by the way oh it was I don't the, even know uh, why I referenced him, but yeah. Why I would have possibly pulled that out of the world, I have no <laughs> idea, but why you expect me. But you said, you know, nothing dates you like that. You know what dates you? Is having long blonde hair like that creep Clay Matthews holds on to. He, that's so, <laughs> that's so uh, early 21st century. Early, so that's, that's, that's so early, like 2010s. <laughs> <laughs> he's a copycat. You're the real deal, Hawk. No, he's got that nice, that nice flowing locks. I had that ratty garbage, and now I don't know what this is. I'm going with. I copy my son. Whatever my son has, I have. I don't know. It's not good. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't grow that nice burly facial hair like you, man. I'm like a little kid. If I try to grow a beard, it doesn't happen. Yeah, 50 years you wouldn't be able to grow something like this. I'm no. swarthy, Hawk. That's I why. Can't. The, the pistol, Keith Hawk, my father. Can't really grow facial hair. My middle brother can barely grow facial hair. My oldest brother can. So it's a genetic thing. It's a trait that I, I got from them. And I don't Boy, we are, we are really going down the tubes here. Now we're talking about whether or not your brothers can grow facial what are we hair. Do? Yeah, I know. This is great. This what is happened, huh? Riveting. This is riveting. <laughs> riveting info. That's why, that's why the good thing is, though, we're just a shade under two hours. We can easily, easily edit that out, but we won't because well, why not? Now, There's, now I, I, I want, I want you know your what? mom to hear this, Damashek. Well, yeah, well, that's right. I know that Mo Damashek, uh, certainly, if no one else appreciates um, this sort of exposure. Um, but, uh, you know, the logical thing to do would be to shut it down here. I say we go the other way. Let's put the pedal Marathon. to the metal. Let's see if we can go through the night in the morning. <laughs> yeah, no, that'd be the best. I, I'm telling you. The, that's the crazy thing. Like a guy like me listens to stuff like that. Guys have these crazy two-part uh, podcasts, three hours, and then the follow-up with the two-hour thing. I've actually listened to stuff like that. That's how weird I am. I might that's skip, awesome, man. I that's might skip cool. through when they talk about their facial hair and their family's facial hair, but then I'll get <laughs> once I'll pick it up after that. <laughs> uh, the um, what we should do is Ike Taylor, you maybe Michael Robinson. We bring some others in. And we just do, like Jerry Lewis on Labor Day, we do a 24-hour <laughs> telethon. We just talk football and nonsense. For Guys, just, we just bump in. We just come in and out as we, as we please. Oh, we lost, we lost Damashek for a second. He's changing the diaper. Yeah. He'll be back. And then you come that's back. That's fine. Wouldn't that yeah. be a, that, And that's how we launch it. And then we just talk about football from now till the end of time. And yeah. who wouldn't be interested in watching that? We break it down, you know? What happens on the flight? No booze on the planes. What you know, yeah. like that? We just what? do that. How do you get? How do you get busted for weed when they tell you when you're getting tested? <laughs> yeah. How does that happen? Well, they didn't quit early enough. <laughs> they tell you. I, yeah, I found out later on in my career in the league that they. I was. I assumed every. They test you for steroids all the time. I assumed every test they just test you for steroids and street drugs. <laughs> And no, I found out like year four, you've tested once a year for street drugs. And ah. you know when it's coming. It's between like April something, 
April 1st and August 1st or something close to that. And so guys that smoke stop hopefully three to four weeks before that April 1st date. And then if they get tested in April and they pass it, boom, they're good to go the rest of the year. Oh, so it is only a once a year thing. So that's pretty easy to just die. For, just for street drugs. Yeah. But even yeah. if they test positive, you're not, it's not made public yet. After your first positive test of like busted for weed, you get put in the program it's called. And I think they make you go to some like meetings with somebody and then they can test you at any time for street drugs. Yeah. So, they can test. That's how Josh Gordon got. Gets exactly. Busted. Yeah. So if you get, it. if you get busted once, if you're dumb enough to get busted that first time when you knew it was coming and you just didn't stop early enough, I guess, um, yeah, then you then I don't think you can get away. You can't do it anymore because they'll test you at any time, just like they do for steroids. Hmm. So yeah, well, I'm sure they just looked at you to save time, and they're like, "Well, obviously you're not on steroids." Let's ne- next. Yeah, yeah, I've never been tested for steroids. They just I walked in, and they're like, uh, no, no, "Let's get some of these other freaks in here." Are you a trainer on <laughs> the you, team? Are hey, you can you go grab? Guy? Can you go grab one of the current players? Uh, they thought, of, yeah. <laughs> They oh, of, you're the kicker! Great. Can you send in some of the guys who do, st- you know, who do physical stuff during the game? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Last thing I'm going to leave you with, just from the steroid test. This, let me show, tell you how, I guess you'd say, arrogant some guys are, or how high of a opinion they have of themselves. There's guy I've seen it happen with multiple times with people, where they'll get tested like a Monday morning after a game on Sunday. And if they felt like they had a good game, like, oh, yeah, random test, huh? Yeah, random game, scored three touchdowns. It's not a random test. And I'm like, bro, this, the list, the random list was sent to this team, I guarantee you, before the game even happened. But they, in their minds, they think, oh, they saw me at 14 tackles. They know. Yeah. They, they want to take me down. They think I'm on steroids. Of course they do. <laughs> you see my game? You see the game I had? 14 pancake blocks. So that happens all the time. And I just laugh. I'm like, I don't even argue with them anymore. Yeah, what the, uh, really think about that from a business standpoint. Does the league want to uh, – the, the guys who are shining brightest at that moment, uh, do you think that it's their interest to say, <laughs> now's the time to take them down? <laughs> Let's take them down. Me. The league's had such a good – had the last couple of good years too. No blemishes at all. <laughs> no, <laughs> nobody getting in trouble. Nobody doing anything bad that gives the, the – the league, uh, a black eye, or anybody else in their <laughs> life, a black eye, and they're gonna, yeah, they want to bust some guy <laughs> that's that's doing well, yeah. So just think about that. But that's a good thing. That's why these these two hour podcasts we have are, are great because we can really get into that stuff. Next time we go for four or shame the devil Easy. as a warm up for the Labor Day one. Yeah, twenty four hours straight through, no breaks. I mean, yeah. you can run off and make water off camera, but we is that your word for seen. taking a leak? Make water. That's right. That's right. Okay, that's good to know. I'm classier than you. I like your one you very much so. I agree, you are. But you're a you know, you're a distinguished media member. But I'm gonna wrap it up, let you go, man. Appreciate it. I think we'll keep this all in. I don't think we'll who cares. My buddy cut Todd. Cut what you want, huh? No, why would you cut it? My buddy Todd, that's the thing. My buddy Todd will we'll send it to him like I guarantee I'll I'll try to upload it tonight. He'll be like, Whoa, oh geez, two hours, what I happened? Get, I get the uh Hawk family's uh follicle uh, issues maybe if that if i were suggesting cuts i might suggest that yeah but. we probably will but you never know but now we got to cut that part you just said right there then so why yeah, cut that's, any? True. that's why you don't even start that whole cut game the, the great thing about it is damashek as we've been speaking this whole time it's on demand so guess what turn it off hit that little 15 second button to go 15 boom 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 boom, boom. like i do when i go past a lot of guys that are having boring conversations about stupid things that we've talked about this whole time I got you. So, yeah, but it's, on, it's on their own, bud. But thanks, we have man. more important stuff to talk to. There you go. you got to bang those Talk about as it approaches. I will, Hawk, I really will root for this team a little bit on your behalf, but not that much. I can't. I mean, what am I going to do? I'm, I, you, know, you try to fight on. Wayne Gretzky. I respect your, um, your loyalty to your squad, so that's great, man. I, I understand it. I respect it even though I'm not on your, your team and I'll be playing against your team. I, uh, I can respect the move, and I, I think it's a great what you're doing with the – all the Pittsburgh Pittsburghers and uh, Mo Damashek, your father, everybody back in Pittsburgh. Hello, if your mom watched this whole thing, God bless her. She's a great woman. <laughs> uh, if she listened, <laughs> if she listened to this whole oh, thing, you think uh, you think I'm kidding? They know enough to say that they love AJ Hawk. Oh, yeah, I mean, but you think you think Mo Damashek doesn't like AJ Hawk after the conversations we've had on the podcast? Of course. Well, here. Oh, he's- he Here seems he- like a nice boy. He <laughs> seems like a, he seems very nice. I love it, man. Well, I love Mo Damashek. Then she sounds like a great woman. She created you, put you out in the world, and 
made you who you are. So she's done great things. Everyone in your life has. But I appreciate you coming on, man. I know uh, I know we went forever, but you know what? You're just uh, you're an interesting dude, and, and bring up so many different topics to me that I wanted to ask you about. But I'll have you back on here at some point, and I'll come on the Dave Damashek football program again, and we will uh, talk. More Let's do it soon. Let's do it in L.A. Why don't you come on out? I'm trying to get out there, man. I'm trying to get out there soon. I, I'm going to do cool. like a lot of the stuff. Uh, go hit a couple of the shows in there and then do a couple podcasts out there, actually, some, with some guys I'm friends with. Uh, oh, nice. But, yeah, I appreciate you coming on, man. We, uh, it was fun. You're a wealth of information. Everyone can find you at Damashek on Twitter. We'll put your link underneath uh, your 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 beautiful beard when we put this video up and uh we'll link any we'll link your web your uh, podcast and everything else you do uh up for you and I want to thank you again man appreciate it we will uh, thanks hawk and again i say to you sincerely uh i'm sad about the way the packer season ended for you and the fellas but i, I i'm over the moon that if you're not going to stay in green bay for you to get to play at home to finish things off that's pretty awesome stuff pretty lucky to start a Buckeye and finish it in the same state, good for you. Thank you very much. I am very grateful for every situation I've had as it comes to football and life. So, now, yeah. now go do something about that hair. We're all very lucky. I'm going to go grow a beard just like you, man. Yeah. All right, man. Damashek, thanks, man. Really appreciate it. Sure thing, Hawk. Thank you for joining in. Please visit thehawkcast.com where you can discover the next guest, get a little more information about why this exists, watch past episodes, or link over to iTunes and tell some friends too so we can all hear more great stories together.